This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. But we're on. Yeah. And today's guest we've done well done, how are we? Um absolutely fantastic, thank you. First and foremost, listen, I just want to say happy birthday. Thank you. Had you turned the big five oh? I am officially half a hundred. I can't believe it, honestly. How are you feeling with that? Do you know what? I honestly I'm a big believer in age is a number and I don't feel any different than I did when I was in my twenties. The only difference is things are a little bit looser than they used to be, a little bit saggier. But um, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm I'm a big believer in it. It's age is just a number, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next fifty years. Reality star, entrepreneur, a woman of many talents. <laughs> but before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a yeah. bit of understanding about you, Don. Where you grew up, and how it all began. Yeah, so I was born at uh, Hope Hospital, which is now Salford Royal, 1973, 16th of July. Um, I am an only child. My mum and dad, um, my mum and dad are, are amazing, by the way. And I'm, before I go on about my parents, I always say now, being a mother of four myself, if I can be half the parents that my parents have been to me, then I'm happy. Um, so my, my dad is the youngest of 20. What? Yeah, 20. He's an Irish family. And he's the youngest. Uh, a lot of his siblings have passed away now. And we've got a very big family because one of my dad's uh, brothers has got 10 children. We've got a huge, huge family. My mum's the eldest of, of seven. Um, and yeah, my dad lost his mother when he was 11 and his dad passed away when he was 15. And I remember my dad telling me that he didn't know an egg had a yolk until he was 15 because he only ever got the top off my granddad's egg. And so when his father passed away, he tells me some really... My dad's my inspiration as well. My dad's like completely self-taught with, with his education, with his business acumen, everything. Uh, like I said, he went into the Merchant Navy when he was 15. He couldn't read or write. He actually tells me the story about when uh, he used to really want a black pair of Wellingtons. He used to sleep in the drawer in the, in the, in the lounge until he got too big to not sleep in the drawer because my nana had so many kids and they didn't have, obviously, enough bedrooms back in the day. And so he was desperate for a black pair of Wellingtons. He was the only child in the school with a white pair because his sister worked for Lucas Aid. <laughs> anyway, my, dad, my granddad passed away. My dad went in the Merchant Navy. Um, like I said, couldn't read, couldn't write. Came home, got a job on the door. Oh, before that, he met my mum. Decided when he met my mum, he would leave the Merchant Navy. And then uh, got himself a job on the doors. And um, my mum was a typist. And then she worked at Little Oaten Labour Club for 20 years. Uh, a barmaid uh, I remember actually being when I was younger she um, my dad used to work for a fencing company called JB Fencing and my mum my dad would come home from work then I would get my pyjamas on my mum would cut my tea she would go to work and then my dad would get me out of bed to jump in his white van to go and pick my mum up from Little Little Labour Club and I always used to get like a packet of port scratchings at the end of the night and then just somehow fall back to sleep in my bed but um, my best memory of my 
childhood, which I've had an amazing childhood. I feel so privileged. Like I said, my parents have been amazing. Is um, I remember when I was about seven, my dad asking me how to spell soldier because he couldn't read and write to the point where my mum t- had to write um, on a pad what the symbols meant on a calculator, like plus, minus, divide. My dad now reads four books a week. He's got a very successful business. Um, my dad's a millionaire and it's all self-taught and he's the most educated, intelligent, switched on human being, whether it's grammar, whether it's maths, whether, it, you know, he's, he's so switched on and it's all self-taught. So what they taught me growing up, my mum knew from quite a young age that she had four stillborn babies, all boys, that was going to be an only child. So I was always told... I used to say, what, a brother or a sister? And she'd say, well, I might get another one like you, joking. Or she'd say, you've got three dogs. Obviously, when I got a lot older and I started, I was pregnant myself, is when she told me that she couldn't have any more children. And she used to tell me, she'd say, you know, I knew you were going to be another child. I can mollycoddle you or I can make you very independent. And that's exactly what she's done. She's made me really independent. Um, My dad used to grab me. I had my first job when I was 12 years old. I worked at Partington Market on a fruit and vegetable because I wanted to buy my mum and dad a present for Christmas. So I worked for six weeks before Christmas. I used to get picked up at 4am. I used to work on Partington Market. I hated it because it used to get my nails dirty. I've always had a, I've always had a bit of OCD with cleanliness. I've, got, I have, I've still got OCD today. And then I managed to save up. And then the guy I used to work for started like touching my ass when I was 12 and it like sort of freaked me out. So I did another two weeks and managed to save enough money up to buy them and then, then I left. But that was my first like, sort of experience with work. But my mum and dad have always made me get out of bed, get jobs. If you want to do something, they've always encouraged me in everything I did. So my whole life growing up, not my parents were never big on education. When I say that, they were running their own businesses. And if I didn't do my schoolwork, they wouldn't really know. Because when I got back from school, they were never there. They were at work. They didn't get back till about six. But what they did, they always used to say, in fact, my dad got bar- barred from going to parents' evening because he wants to tax... The, the, the history teacher said that I struggle with concentration. I'm easily distracted and distracts others. And he started going, what the fuck do you know? How do you know what my daughter is? Who are you to tell me? You're all a load of ponces and you can... But he's never been to parents' evening since. That was his only parents' evening. But I guess they never really... My mum always used to say to them, is she cheeky? Is she rude? And they'd say, no, she's pleasant. Well, the rest is your problem. But they were never really keeping their eye on my education. So I ended up leaving school when I was 15 without a qualification, didn't have a GCSE. Um, In fact, I went into my mock exams and wrote Dawn was here on the the table and got caught and got flung out of the hall. I'm not proud of that. What my parents did do, though, they gave me, I can walk into any room and I never feel intimidated in any situation. I'm super confident. I can somehow always, always talk people around to my way of thinking. So I guess when I got older and had ch- children of my own, I, I, I think for me the most important is to make sure your children are polite, make sure they've got a good heart and good feeling about other people's feelings, uh, make them streetwise, but also, especially because of Ashley, give them a great education. So that's what I've tried to do with my children to sort of... Li- live up to my parents but with the added education yeah i think as older you get you start to realize schools limit your mental capacity where you can take things in life and where you see the world just because you're distracted easy and don't listen and not really interested in school it doesn't mean you are you'll never do anything in your life there's so many successful people now who didn't learn how to read or write and weren't good at school who then become multi-millionaires multi-billionaires because they've learned from outside of school so i think your dad's probably Listen, there's not many people do it who educate themselves after it because they're so caught up in trying to make something or trying to survive. But fair play to him for trying to understand life and trying to make something, not just for his missus, but for yourself and yeah. be a good father. And for me, that's so important for any father is trying... It's, we all talk about me, alpha and masculinity now and people... Everybody's just talking shit. The most alpha thing you can do is life is look after your family. Yeah. No matter if it's just fucking buying them a loaf of bread and beans for them to eat from sitting eating five course meals. It doesn't matter. As long as you're providing for them, for me, you're winning. Well, I just think as well, I think, I think the biggest thing my parents taught me, a lot of people, especially being on the Real Housewives on TV, a lot of people when they first meet me don't really like me. 
and I get that. But most people, when they get to know me, actually think I'm, not, I'm a nice person because I'm quite hard on the outside, but I'm very soft on the inside. And I guess my mum and my dad, the biggest thing they taught me growing up, which I have in, definitely instilled in my children, or both me and Ashley have, is it's about caring about other people's feelings, not being a bad person. If someone's upset, if they've done something wrong and they say sorry and they're genuinely sorry, forgiveness and being an all, being a nice, understanding people's feelings um, and appreciating what you've got. So just going back to my parents, I remember back, so I've had times when I was a lot younger and I remember they used to bring the brown book out and it used to terrify me because that's the one time my parents really argued. And I never knew what this brown book was. Um, but what it was is the household finances. And they used to scream at each other. And it used to, it's the one time where I used to dread the brown book coming out. Um, and then this is obviously when my dad had a job. We moved around houses quite a lot. We lived in Astley to start. So we, I originally started off in Little Holton. Then we moved to Astley. But then obviously I didn't understand this when I was younger. But... We moved out of Astley because my parents were getting into a financial situation. Then we moved to Bury and we rented a house and I went to another school. And then eventually we then moved to Bolton. Uh, I was about eight at the time. And uh, I'm just, I'm laughing actually. Uh, I've just moved to Bolton. And we lived on, um, we lived on a private estate. And then two seconds down the road was a council estate. It was on Hunger Hill. And back in the day, you could let your dog out the front door, your dogs would roam, your cats would roam, your kids would roam, you could play Kirby. You'd go out at eight in a summer holiday and say to your mum and dad goodbye, and you were gone all day. So off I went in my chopper <laughs> to find new friends, and I met all these kids uh, on the council estate, uh, who are still friends of mine today. But it's so funny how, how life is, and I told you about confidence. I was so desperate to make friends that I told everyone on the estate that we had a tiger, a monkey, a rhino and a giraffe. And that I was like the Pied Piper. Them. I must have had 25 kids I wanted to be friends of mine. So I brought them to the semi-detached house that we lived on, on um, in West Halton. Anyway, I was like taking them all in the garden saying, oh, you know, my dad's put all the animals. He'd have to come back tomorrow. So my mum was mortified saying, you cannot go and tell lies to everybody. You can't tell lies to, to tell people that you've got all these animals. If they want to be your friend, they'll be your friend. So the following day I go back. I still don't listen to my mum. I tell them I've got all these animals. Fortunately, my mum was out, but my dad was in. And I just told them all they have to wait outside for a sec. Went in to say, Dad, I've told everyone lies and told them I've got all these animals. He went, don't worry about it, kiddo. I've always been a daddy's girl. He went out. He went, listen, kids, the animals are asleep. But if you come back next week, if I've not sold them, I'll let you all see them. And to this day, they still think I had all the animals because my dad always had me back. My mum would always try and teach me morally. But in my dad's eyes, I could do no wrong. It doesn't matter what I did, he would defend me and he still does that today. What did you do after school? So, um, yeah, so I did modelling as a, a young teenager, sort of from being 12 to 14. And then I said to you, I left school when I was 15. Um, my dad, well, I think I was about 22 before my dad realised I didn't even do my GCSEs because back in the day it wasn't, well, it was compulsory, but they sort of didn't chase you. If you didn't want to go to school, you didn't need to. So my mum said, if you're going to leave school, uh, then you need to get a job. So I managed to get a job at the Royal Exchange in Manchester for a, a German Jewish lady. And it was it was a place called La Linea and it was in the Royal Exchange downstairs. And it was a posh design and market stall basically and I could sell snow to an Eskimo and literally back in the, I, was, I was like 15 um, I think she ended up paying me like £180 a week which was a fortune even the year after when a lot of my friends left school they were on £28.50 as YTS and I used to have this knack where we'd get a lot of travellers in or we'd get people with a lot of cash and I, and, I, and I sort of gauge what they liked and what they didn't like. I first find out the first name, so it'd be Tracy. And I'd be like, hi, Tracy. And when I'd give them a set of clothes to put on, I could just see in their face, they didn't quite like it. I used to pretend to look at the manager and go, listen, don't tell her I've told you, but it's awful, get it off. And they go, yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh, that one's nice. They'd trust me straight away. I'd be selling, honestly. I'd sell so many clothes. Then when I was 16, I was approached off a model agency in London to move to London. So I handed in my notice and um, 
And she actually offered me a manager's position in a new shop, which wasn't in the Royal Exchange. It was actually on King Street because was, I was the biggest seller in the shop. But obviously then I decided, no, I'm going to go to London. So my mum, which was a very brave decision, allowed me to go to London and move in a model flat at 16 years old. So then off I went to move to London. How was that feeling? 16, young? I never felt young. scared, feared? Never. Never felt young. Felt like I feel today. And I always have done, even like, I always have felt, I've never felt like scared or intimidated or, I haven't, I just, you know, I think what I just said to you earlier on, I feel the same as then, as I do now. Do you get that from your dad? Uh, no. Confidence I get from my mum. Your mum confident? Yeah, my mum's like the most, the strongest woman. No, no, forget that. She's not the strongest woman, she's the strongest human being I've ever met in my life. The only person stronger than her is me now. How was your dad at that age? Because my daughter's 13 and even thinking about her going to London at 16, for me, I don't give a fuck what job it is, she's not going. Oh, and I get that and that's how I would feel today. How did your dad feel? Um, Does he support of or was he yeah, so baby, my mom and dad have got a great, Yeah, so he's like, my parents have got a great marriage, but if my mum thinks it's okay and it's cool, my dad will go with it. And she came down. I didn't go and move to London and just live on my own. I went with a model agency that had a, a flat where we all lived so it wasn't just me it was like a big group of girls uh, I don't know if you know but she's uh, one of the girls that I lived with at the time she ended up being a TV presenter called Jane Middlemas yeah yeah so she lived with us and then so we started doing all these modeling assignments going for castings and then me and Jane I like being tied in Jane's quite a, I've not seen her for years but in fact I've not seen her since we, we party company but um we decided we didn't want to stay in the model flat with a group of people. So we then moved to Streatham and me and her rented, because uh, we had to move further out, and we rented a flat in Streatham and we both got a job in a pub. She got a job on the high street in one pub and I got a job in the other. So we could make 12 quid a night in the pub, which that was enough if we were at the pub, five days we could pay the rent. And then the modelling money then was just a bonus. You could buy clothes and... And yeah, we lived together, me and Jane, for about a year. And then she ended up getting quite friendly with the landlord of the pub, and then she moved in with him. I then got really friendly with another friend of mine, uh, Carl, who had one arm. He had daddy's arm amputated. Um, and he, he was on the dole. And uh, just friends, not nothing not, nothing sexual. Just, just friends, by the way. <laughs> just friends. But I thought, well, you'll be great to move in with me because if you're on the dole, I'll just get the rent every week whether you work in the pub or not. So I did another year of that. Then we moved to Bayswater. And then I eventually moved. My dad, in the end, ended up saying he'll put some money in and I moved to Chelsea. So funny story about Chelsea. It was right next to where the Conrad used to be. I don't know what the hotel's called now. It's the main hotel in Chelsea Harbour. Then I met another friend who was a modern called Lisa Nice. And she was from quite a wealthy family in Suffolk. And so my dad chipped in a bit. Her dad paid all her rent. I still had to put some of my money in. And then we had a beautiful apartment there. And then one day we had the ground floor apartment. I'd just come out of the shower. I had my head in a towel. And there was these, we used to always get uh, lots of, um, what they called, like groupies and fans. Because you used to get big stars staying at the Conrad at the, back in the day. And I'm going back to 1990. And... Um, there was screaming fans outside because Madonna's here or whatever. This particular week, it's Guns N' Roses are here. And I love it. I love rock music. So I'm like, oh, Guns N' Roses are there. It's brilliant. So I'm on my balcony having a look at some ground floor. I see them all, all the, them all going in and out of the limousines and stuff. Anyway, went in the shower. Um, then I could hear my flatmate screaming ahead of going, oh, you know. Anyway, I came out, put my dressing gown on, got a tower on my head. I go in there and there's Axel Rose and Matt Sorum stood in the middle of my lounge. And I was, anyway, long story short, went a couple of nights out with them. Nothing happened, by the way. But then became really good friends with Matt Sorum. But then not long after that, I met Ashley. Um, I went back, I left, I w I'd gone home for the weekend to see my family from London. And where I used to live in West Horton, and I said to you, I had the council estate opposite, at Hunger Hill, there was a pub. And it was called the Tavern on the Hill. And it was the place to be. Everyone and anyone went to the tavern. So uh, my first experience at the tavern was when I was 15. And my mum would, would never let me drink. She was, my mum was teetotal and she still is today. Actually, she has the odd drink, but very rarely. 
and she was very, very much against. She could always give me my freedom, but I used to promise her I wouldn't drink alcohol. So I said to her, can I go in the tavern with all my friends? This is before I met Ashley. And she said, no, you're not going in the tavern, you're 15. I'd say, okay. But then, obviously, you then tell your mum you're going somewhere else. But my mum always finds something out. So she found out I'd gone in the tavern. So she marched in the tavern, grabbed me, I was panicked. I had a Diet Coke in my hand because I always thought if she ever sees me drinking. When my mum says no, it means no. There's no, no, it might, maybe. Yes is yes, no is no. Marched me out, put, pulled me to the doorman and said, look, she's 15, so do not let her back in here again. They were like, no, we won't. Anyway, the following week I went, snuck in again. And she found out the doorman come running in because I got really friendly with them. They were like, your mum's here, get out the back door. <laughs> so I ended up, in the end, she realised I was going in there and she was like, well, you can go in there because my dad, it was my dad that said to her, look, all her friends are going in there. You've told her not to drink. She's not drinking, so let her go in there. So she did. As long as she had control of everything, my mum. But I was 14, so she let me... I used to have to be in before it was dark. I mean, when it's winter, it's dark at four o'clock. I'm like, mum, it's four o'clock. And it's dark, she didn't care. I had to be in when that first light street lamp came on. I had to be in that house. So in the end, she finally gave in and bought me a pony. And I got into horses, because that was a way of her keeping me occupied. drinking cider on, with my friends on the park. It kept me occupied and it lasted till, again, till I moved to London till I was 16. So you met your husband, Ash, yeah, at 17? Yeah, so came, came home. Uh, yeah, just, just where did you meet? We met in the tavern where my mum dragged me out of. So I'd come home for the weekend, got older, some of my friends in Bolton. So I had, had the best time in Bolton. I spent, a lot of people think I'm from Bolton, I'm actually from Salford. But I spent, well, my school, well from being eight till, to senior school, I love Bolton. I'm a, Sorry, because I'm diverting on okay. to the Ashley story. So um, I was quite popular at school, very gobby, very chatty, so like I am now. Nothing's changed then, No, eh? no. <laughs> uh, always a leader. Um, a lot of fights at school. We used to have girls coming from different... I used to have a best friend called June Brown. Oh, God, here we go. Who was my best friend all through school. Um and she was a year older than me. And I used to get girls coming from different schools to fight me in June. Because it was my Auntie Lisa, my mum's sister, that made me have, have a fight when I was six. I mean, I know it sounds a bit ridiculous now. I'm going back to my upbringing. They said, you have to have a fight. I said, well, I don't want to fight. Yeah, but you live in Little Alton. You have to be able to stick up for yourself. Um, again, this was like teaching me to be strong in life, early doors. And uh, she's like, you know, you need to grab hold of the hair, pull them down. If you get them down, knee them in the face. Then when you've, once you've kneed them, you've won, walk away. Fast forward to mid coming, moving to Bolton. I then met June Brown, who again was a year older than me. The only probably person, apart from my mother, that's got bigger hands than I have, because I have genuinely got hands like any other. Look at the size of them. They're huge. Um, and we became, her mum was, her, mom, her parents were from Jamaica. We became absolutely inseparable. And from being nine till she killed herself when she, when we were, when she was, twen I was 23, we were inseparable. And if anyone was going to pick on me, we'd jump into each other. So if someone wanted to fight with June, they had to take me on as well. And everybody tried to make us fight for all those years in school. She spent every weekend sleeping at my house. I used to stick her on a pony when she couldn't ride and she'd fall off it. We were, the, we were inseparable. And then, unfortunately, years later, she got onto drugs um, and, and she hung herself. But How was that for you when you found out that? Oh, God. I'm so not over it now. And I'll come on to, I'll come on to that in a second. Um, for years, oh, it was terrible. Because I sort of, because I've met Ashley, um, I tried to help June. She got onto heroin. I tried to help her. I was in London living. I was making money. Um, I was sending her money trying to help her, but I said, well, I can't give you money if you, if you can use it for drugs. And she, she eventually got clean. She had a little boy, Fidel, who was beautiful. So her and Fidel used to come and stay with me and Ashley in Norwich when he was the footballer. She'd be so impressed with the house I had and dead proud of me. She keeps saying, I'm really proud of you. I used to buy her little boy stuff. And she ended up getting a job, but she'd... When she was on the drug, she um, she started to steal. And it's as daft as going insane with and stealing a bottle of whiskey because she could sell it to feed a habit. 
And there was this one policeman that had it in for her, was sick of arresting her. She obviously got aggressive with him. She had a, they had some kind of like animosity, this one policeman. Anyway, eventually she got off the drugs, she got clean. She had great parents as well. Her mum was fantastic. Like one of her sisters, a lawyer. Um, and she got a job in Storm Seal, which was a window company back then. I don't know if it's still around this today. And she, I never forget, she ran me in. It was when Ashley was playing for Leicester. So I Norwich, and she said, um, I've, I've lost my job. I said, how have you lost your job? She said, because the policeman's been in and said, do you realise she's got a criminal record? Which today that couldn't happen, you know. Obviously, it's, it's against the law to not divulge that you've got a criminal record. But she'd been working there for eight months. She'd been clean. She'd not been on drugs. A little boy was happy. Her mum was delighted. And they, But they said to her, because you haven't, told us at the outset on your interview that you've got a criminal record because she was locked up for, for, for nicking from Sainsbury's. They said, we're going to have to let you go, but we'll give you a glowing reference. And she was crying on the phone to me. She was like, I can't leave the house. I was like, but and it's the one thing I regret in my life. I said, June, you can't come here because at the time my husband was getting more well-known in football and I was thinking, God, she's been arrested. And I selfishly thought myself and my, my own image rather than my best friend anyway um three weeks later she went to cyprus i think it was and then i got the call she hung herself yeah but again it's hard because i was the same my uncle got murdered and he was younger and i was going through changes i used to party all the time with everybody but when you start making changes and you don't, and i was started feeling good only if you kind of don't want anybody not jeopardize it but you just want to stay in the straight and narrow but sometimes yeah, but we can have that. No, think, but I did. I regret you, this. Do you blame regret. yourself for that? Yeah, yeah. Because forget actually being a footballer or any kind of bullshit football press or whatever. That was a friend that was been my friend since I was nine, and would have would have died for me. And I feel like I really let her down. So anyway, I got the call. It took me years to get over it, and then it was really funny because like I went to the funeral. It was horrific. I travelled in the car with the family. It was and to see a little boy and just think I did, I'd feel like I, I should have got her to Norwich with me. I should have helped her more. I should have, I should have done some. I kept going back and every time I go back, I'd have lunch with her and she was slow and I'm like, I can see her on heroin, June. I can't keep helping you. And then, and then I actually, uh, I had a nursing home at the time, which I've not got into with my business things. I've, I've been flitting, sorry. I've gone from That's different okay. parts of my life. And where the nursing home was, at night time, it come alive with prostitutes and, and I'll never forget once getting in my Mercedes and I looked out and I was like, oh my God, it's June. But it was June, but half the weight, she was very thin. I grabbed her, put her in my car. She promised, it was just, it was, we were just backwards and forwards all the time. And it was so sad because she was the most amazing person. But if that policeman had just left her alone, maybe things would have been different. If she'd got a job, she wasn't stealing. Go and find another criminal that's doing wrong and leave her alone. She's got a job. Mm -hmm. Obviously, June being June, she must have wound him up that much that he felt it. He wanted to go in and jeopardise the fact that she'd got a job. And that was the that was the end of June, really. That was it was weeks later she was dead. How much do you not play on it? But it just shows you, because for my best friends in the past and everybody chooses different lifestyles, I've kind of blessed to, I've been a bloomer to being blessed to then try and make some for my life. But friends who are, much wiser than me, smarter than me, who then passed away. And do you ever look at that and think how life's then going different directions? Yeah, but again, for me, I do, because I could have gone in a different direction. Could you have ended up there with a different well, kind of relationship? Well, it wasn't a relationship for me. June's problem started way before I started my relationship with Ashley. I have amazing parents, and I'm not saying June's parents weren't amazing, because they were, but... They've always, my mum's always given me leeway. I can always go to my mum and tell her anything. So I don't feel I've ever got any secrets and she's never really been judgmental, but in a weird way. And I go back to even when I was a child, when my dad started to make money, he got an XR4 i before anyone had ever seen one. We had the first answering machine. We had the first video recorder. I remember going to primary school telling everyone, I've got this thing where you can put a tape in and you can press record and it'll record your cartoon. and. We were always the first to have everything later on in my life when I was like from eight, because my dad ended up starting his own business. 
but what my parents were amazing at is I had more than anyone in my school from from a material point of view. I had a cap of coat, I had kicker trainers, kicker shoes, Adidas kick, Farrah pants, I can remember. You know, um, I went on every school holiday because my mum wanted to meet, because I was another child, have the experiences of going on school trips. But somehow, with everything I had, she never made me think I, I expected anything. She was the best at making me, at Christmas, I, used to, I really wanted a flute. I'll never forget, I wanted to play the flute. But I never thought I was going to get a flute. I never thought I was going to get a Commodore 64 the year after. I used to like churn in my stomach with excitement, thinking I wonder if I'm, what I'm going to get. And somehow she made me still appreciate and not expect things the way she did it. Um, I never thought, I want a flute, so I'm going to get a flute. I never thought I'd get one, but I did. She was so good at doing that, that I believe later on in life, she was the master at being the control, the controlling person in my, in my upbringing. Um, and as much as she, I think she'd be letting me do things like go to London, she'd always have the eye on me and she'd give me the trust that made me never want to let her down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's why my paths, that's maybe why my paths were different than June because June's mum was lovely. But maybe I, but a little, not quite as strong. And um, June was scared of my mum. There was nobody, not every kid in the school was scared of my mum, even though she was nice. Still today, every all my friends today, all my daughter's friends, they all call her Nana Lynn. Nana Lynn has a big presence in everyone's life. I think a lot of parents are missing that now. Not to be strict and beat your kids, but a lot of kids are walking over parents and I think I feel as if a lot of kids nowadays have got more say with the parents I think parents should be a little more stricter parents have lived that life they see be... I, with my children I do exactly the same as my mum did it's very simple I'll never make a, a promise and break a promise but I'll never make a threat and it'll be an empty threat so if I you get these parents that say and I think it, it goes so many people say to me today you're so lucky your four children are amazing that has nothing to do with luck. The reason the children are amazing is because me and Ashley have been amazing parents. So we've always been like, what, the way I am with my kids, if I promise them, if you do that, you'll get that. Whatever happens, I'll get them that because I've made a promise. But if I say to them, do that again and this will happen, I don't say do that again and this will happen. Do that again. and I say it once. If they do it again, it'll happen. So they know. It used to be, it's funny, it's hard to say on, a, in the, on an interview now, we've all got to be truthful. My mum used to go, if you ever, ever do that again, you get a slap on your head for every word. So when Darby and Taylor were younger, they'd get a slap. I didn't smack my next two children, because back then people smack the children, they don't smack them anymore. And actually, now I remember, never forget once, I think it was Darby, she was about 12 or something and I'd smacked her and I'd said to, oh, I'd said to her, right, you've no Facebook, you've no this. She was coming in my room going, please, mum, just smack me and give me my Facebook back. So you get to learn that at a certain age, you've got to follow up your threats through and that once somebody knows, and I've got, I know it sounds daft, it's not about, it sounds a bit weird this, it's not a coincidence that my four dogs in Dubai are all well behaved because they all know there's a consequence. <laughs> if you don't go out the door when I tell you, there's going to be a consequence. So them consequences never happen because the children or animals or your husband. I'm a big motto in life. My mum's saying a problem's there to be solved and you only get what you put up with. And if you put up with it, you'll get it. And if you don't, you won't. So I don't put up with anything, whether that's my children, my dogs, my husband, my friends, my work colleagues. It doesn't have to be in a nasty way, but if I've got a problem, I, I air it. And it's done. I'm not somebody that's going to sit there and be, oh, I don't really like the way they're doing that. I just address everything and I nip it in the bud. Yeah, you've got to, especially in this day and age. Yeah. So 17, Ash, 31 years later, still together. How did the relationship start? So he'd love this. He'd love to be here now, Ashley, and I'm going to have to be honest. Okay, so I was seeing a guy called Chris Jones and he's the only person that I've ever let mess me about. So... He used to always cheat on me. So I was already living in London. He was the boyfriend I'd had for, on and off for a year or two. So then I said to him, right, okay, so rather than be disappointed and you keep cheating on me, if I'm in London, you see who you want to see. But when I'm back, 
were exclusive. What better opportunity can you have as a man? So I'd come back, and while I was back, I physically, in front of my own face, he was cheating again. So anyway, I went out on the Sunday, I was mortified, but he had, he had one over me all the time, so it makes you want somebody more, but it did then. So I said to my friend, it was actually one of my friends that I said to you, I've met a group of friends in the council estate, Melanie Locke, who's unfortunately hung herself as well, believe it or not, Jacqueline Locke, her sister. So I'd, I'd, I'd called all my friends, because I stayed friends with them for the rest of my life, for, for the rest of my school years. I'd said, you know, I'm home from London, she would go in the tavern. Well, when I was 17, my dad bought me an MR2i. That was unheard of. People, where I was from, where I lived, he just didn't have an MR2i. It was like having a Ferrari. It was a T-bar, the new shape. Little two doors. Oh, yeah, blue. But the new shapes, it was rounder at the front. So rock up in my MR2i. He only had two two seats. But I used to fit about five of my friends in one seat. <laughs> it was literally a two-minute. You'd all be like squeezing the head out. But it was literally a two-second drive to the tavern. We said we'll go in the tavern. Sunday night, busiest night of the week. Didn't drink at the time. So I've just got my Diet Coke. My friends are all dancing. It's heaving. And I look across the room and I just think... Well, I could see this lad looking and I was looking at him and he was with a group of friends. And I said to my friends, he's about the best looking in here tonight. But didn't really fancy, it was, wasn't thinking, oh God, he's gorgeous. I just thought he's about the best looking. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was that. Never got talking to him. Got in the car park. Uh, and we got talking in the car park and he was in an XR2i, which again, was a flash car for somebody, you know. People didn't have XR2, XR2i's in them days. Anyway, we got to chat him. And um, I said to him, oh, we exchanged numbers, and that was that. And this is the bit Ashley loves. So that was that. I didn't contact him, went back, and I ended up getting back with Chris. And Chris cheated on me again. So I thought, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ring that lad I met the other week in the tavern, only to piss Chris off. So that's the bit Ashley loves, the fact that I rang him. So I rang him up and we agreed to meet. So we said, oh, for some reason, I don't remember why, but I got my friend to drop me off, even though I had my own car. So I went in there. We had, I had a couple of Diet Cokes. We got chatting. He said, I'll drop you off home. Got in his XR2Y. And when I got in his car, someone had left a note on his windscreen wiper with a number. And he pulled it out, read it, he screwed it up, and he threw it where my feet were in the, in the footwell. So I'm sat there thinking, yeah, he's a player. Why is he not throwing it out of the window? Why is he throwing it in the footwell? Because when I'm gone, he's going to open it up and ring her. I obviously, a year, a year, months later, I realised he, he was so against throwing rubbish out of the window. So that's why I didn't throw out the window. And what I didn't tell you is, when he came to meet me, and before, when he walked into the pub, I ended up getting there first. I thought, fucking hell. I do not remember you looking like that. Last time I seen you a few months ago, I was, my jaw was dropping. I went, he is fit. And he was like, I just didn't remember him looking like that. I don't know what I was looking at weeks ago. I was like, wow. He's, so I played cool. Um, and yeah, he dropped me off. Did he give me a kiss that night? I think, I um, can't remember. But then he asked to take me out again. But it was always on a weekend. And I was thinking, well, I told him I lived in London. He said to me at the time, he said, I'm living in Leicester and I'm staying in Diggs. Well, my dad's in the building industry. So the only word, the only place I've heard the word Diggs is if you're in the building industry and you're staying away for maybe two weeks and you put, you put your staff in Diggs. So then we got to see it. So we'd usually meet up on the weekend. I'd go back to London. He'd go back to Leicester. Then we'd meet up. And... Um, and then we started meeting up in, um, then he, oh, and then I said to him, it was about six weeks in, then we used to, then we went from the tavern to the uh, discotheque Royale in Manchester. Then I used to get butterflies when I seen him. And, uh, and then about six weeks later, I said, when are you finishing this job? This, what is it you do? Because we didn't even think to ask what he did, because he just said he stayed in digs. He said, oh, I'm a footballer. And I'm at Leicester City. And that was why did I never tell you? Usually that's the first thing you hear. Well, no, I didn't really, because he was so fit. I was just more interested in kissing him. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't really ask. I had a better car than him anyway, so didn't really need him. Didn't really need. I, I had a Rolex watch, he didn't. In fact, I bought his first Rolex watch when he was 21. How, how old was he? Um, so I was, I met Ashley 
not the very first time, I can't remember when we very first met, but the first proper date where we had a full on snog and everything, and I met him in Manchester was on his 21st birthday. Actually, on the on his birthday, so it's the 20, uh, 24th of November. So two young 1990. kids. 1990. In this day and age, there's more divorced than ever. How do you keep a successful marriage together? What's the ingredient? So for me, I think um, I really fancied Ashley. I still fancy her. Well, actually, people say, do you fancy Ashley today? I actually don't know whether I do fancy him or I don't because I don't look at him and think, you're really fit. Well, I look at him and think, you're my person, you're mine, and I don't want to be with anybody else. But I think I must fancy. I do fancy. Do I do fancy? Yeah, he's a handsome man. He's very handsome. Still ripped. Well, put it this put, way: put any women your... go near him, I am a nightmare. I am such so possessive, like really possessive. My kids go mad at me. My kids laugh at me actually, especially now, like with my, you, my girls, and you, especially with Taylor being with Riyadh, and you got a lot of girls hanging around. They they more laugh at me with girls dancing with Ash, even though he's the dad, because I would go. Cr I'm so jealous. Ashley always said. For years on, you'd go to girls that came up to when you play football. I'm really sorry, I'm not being rude. It'll just end really badly because my, my wife's a nutter. So can you just go and talk to somebody else? It feels terrible. How is really it insecure. now? Obviously, when you get a football career, confident, doing well, the ladies loving you. Is it flat now that he's retired? And I am still a bit... Uh, sometimes I'm still a bit... Yeah, he was never, ever, ever possessive for me. But... He definitely likes me going out less than being with him. But we don't really go out singly anymore. We never have done, to be honest. I would say, I look at Ashley's parents, who are absolutely amazing. His parents are so lovely, and we've not spoken about Maureen and Terry, because they're a big influence on my life as well. How so? The, pardon? How so? Just, they're amazing. You know, from the day I met them, the beautiful people. His dad's, again, self-made like my father. Um, his his mum's... His mum is... Like Elizabeth Taylor, she's the most elegant, beautiful, elegant, classy lady. I became, she became like my second mum. I'm the only person that she's ever took back to meet his parents. I'm the only girl that ever got introduced to his parents. That's when you know it's true love, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and but they must be lookers because he's a big handsome bastard. It, both of them are stunning. Honestly, both his parents, like his dad's handsome, but he looks very much like his mum. His mum, honestly... She still is beautiful today. His mum, unfortunately, now is in. It's got dementia. She's got oh, Alzheimer's. Sorry to hear that. But um, she's incredible. And and actually, when sorry, I've got so much to tell you. Honestly, my life's cool. long. Yeah. So I'll take you back to. So we met mm. me and Ashley. Then we started seeing each other. Then I started staying in Leicester. And then I didn't know this till later on. And his mum told me his mum and dad had gone stay with him. And he won't let me, he'd, he'd make an excuse up and I wouldn't stay that that weekend. And he'd say he's got something on, but it's obviously had his mum and dad there. He didn't want to tell me, he didn't want his mum and dad knowing I was staying. But she said, I used to see like packets of tights and the odd hairspray. So I knew he had a, he was seeing somebody, then obviously he introduced him to his parents. Um, and his mum and dad have been, you know, his dad's 91 now and his mum's 87, I think. They're still together. My parents are still together. And I think... You know, we've both come from very strong marriages from our parents that people used to say to me, you get married, you're only 21. But I met the right person at 21. I could wait till I'm 30 and not meet the right person. I didn't want to be with anybody else. Like for a couple of weeks after we met in the tavern for the, for the real date, we've been together ever since. And, you know, we're just like, we, we work together. We've got quite an unusual marriage because... We work together, we go out together, we eat together, we're together 24 hours a day, mainly seven days a week. It would only be the odd hour in a week where he'd go for a meeting or I nip somewhere. Or occasionally I'd go out with my friends and he'll go out and have a pint with his friends. But in general, we go out together and we go out with couples. We, we, we cry, we laugh, we, we share our problems, we run our business. He is like... I can't describe, like, he's, he's my absolute soulmate. He's, he's, he's incredible, honestly. He's, I'm quite, he, I'm, he's very pessimistic. I'm very optimistic. And when in business, I take all the awards. I, I'm the face of everything. 
Ashley sweeps up all the shit and solves all the problems. He, I just, you know, he always says, I get wheeled out when there's a problem, but he's the sharp one and the smart one behind everything. And especially because in the public and in front of people, I'm quite loud. Ashley's very laid back. They say, oh, poor Ashley. But let me tell you, there's only one person wears the trousers. And Ashley wears the trousers in the house. You know, he's the man of the house. But we do do everything 50-50. So, you know, it's 50% decisions. With everything we do, we do it 50-50. Um, we, we share every problem, every happiness. Uh, and he makes me laugh. We laugh our head off. We've got a great sex life. <laughs> everything. <laughs> but that's the way relationship should be in my yeah, eyes. Yeah, it's everything. He's, he's my bestest friend. Yeah, I feel as if everybody's kind of divided and everybody's apart. And I think as a family, it should be united. It should be dealing with the fucking situations and the problems together and also celebrating the good times. Do you feel as if because of his mum and dad were still together and your mum and dad, you then see how relationships should be working? No, I look at them and think, I don't think that's why ours works. What I'm saying is when I look at their relationship, I don't, I just think it's a, I think you have to meet the right person to start. Me and Ashley were the right people. We're very, we were opposites, but we gel. And it just so happens that his parents have got an amazing marriage. My parents have got an amazing marriage. Um, so we've got good foundations. And again, nothing's perfect. There's been issues in our marriages along the way where we've had to work very hard and we've solved, solved our issues. But we don't give up. Our marriage is there. No, nothing's perfect. And there's no marriage, no relationship perfect. It's getting a lot more perfect now we're getting older. Oh, we used to scrap like a dog when we were younger. I threatened to take the dogs home. We had to put, we had a bull mastiff pup. You know, um, we used to fight. The first two years when we lived together, we used to fight so much. And then I always used to say, I want to be engaged, I want to be engaged. And he said to me, look, stop, keep asking me to be engaged. Just because your friends are engaged or you know somebody. I'm not just going to get engaged for being engaged. When I ask you to marry me, it's because I want to get married, not because I want to get engaged. So then four years after we met, uh, he'd moved clubs then. I think we was playing at, it was at, oh, we got engaged, wait a second. He was at Crew. No, he was at Crew. He was at Crew because we were living with my parents because we were doing a house up at the same time in, in, in Oldham. So Valentine's Day comes. Ashley doesn't do flowers and stuff. He, he just thinks they're a waste of money. And he goes, so why do I have to do that to show you I love you? I said, because it's Valentine's Day. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so um, he thinks it's a load of bullshit. He just thinks it's a load of commercial. And he's like, I'm like, I want flowers. So anyway, Valentine's Day, 1994, we're, we're living with my mum and dad. And um, he's playing at crew and I get, I get all these red roses. I'm like, oh my God, he's finally bought me flowers. So we came back. He said, we'll go for dinner tonight. But at the time, I had like a chest infection. I'd lost my voice. And I really I didn't feel well, but it was Valentine's night. He said, I've booked, um, whatever it was called, the restaurant in West Horton in Italian. And then uh, he went, they cost me 50 quid, them flowers. I said, I don't want to know how much they cost. I'm just happy you bought me flowers. Yeah. He must have told me that day they cost me 50 pounds, the flowers. I was like, stop telling me how much the flowers cost. I'm happy you bought me the flowers because he couldn't. He went, there's five died. I went, what's the point in buying flowers if you're just going to keep going on about how much they cost? Anyway, at one point, because he was pissing me off about these flowers, and I actually nearly cancelled going out for dinner with him. Anyway, he's like, don't get like that, don't get like that, I'm only joking. So we went for dinner, I went to the, this Italian, but I felt really rough and I was getting a temperature and I was like, come on, I want to go home. Well, since we last went in the tavern all those years before, it had gone a bit rough and it weren't the place to be anymore. No one, there's, there'd been a bit of trouble over the years and fighting, so no one really went in there. He was going, should we go in the tavern for one? I was like, why do you want to go in the tavern? Why you, well, just let's go home. Because my parents lived in Lee. He was like, I want to, let's go in the tavern. I was like, I don't want to go in the tavern, please. I thought, right, I'm not going to spoil his night, go in the tavern. Went in there, had one Diet Coke, got in the car, and when we got in the car, I could see him smiling, looking out the window. So I'm thinking, have oh, we seen somebody like Gary Flickcroft or one of his friends that used to go in the tavern? So I'm looking at thinking, who's he seen? So he turned to me and he went, I really love you now. I'm thinking, God, I just need to go home. I feel really, I went, I love you too. Can we go home? Said, please. He went, I can't even say, no, it still makes me embarrassed today. He went, it's because he said, please. He went, will you marry me, please? I went, ah! And I opened the car door and ran off. 
I was so embarrassed because I just was not expecting it. And I felt, I don't know why, but I felt really embarrassed. But what he did, he took me back to the middle of the car park for the day for where we met. So when everyone tells me they got engaged in Paris, I have to tell the full story. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to think Ash is a right tight ass, <laughs> taking me to the tavern and, and proposing to me in the car park. Was he nervous? Well, no, he just, it, he said, please. So anyway, he drove around the car park, got back in. I just remember putting my head down and he was like, you know, uh, well, 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 what do you say? I was like, yeah. And I just felt really, so we never spoke all the way home. I was thinking, I can't wait to tell mum and dad when I get home. And he, he tried to make small talk. But I think we both, it was weird because we've been together for four years then. And uh, we lived together. So I couldn't wait. I was bursting with excitement to tell mum and daddy's asked me to marry him. When I got home, everyone was there and they'd already told him all because they did the right thing and asked my dad. What were you doing for work then? Um, so then. Were you working at all because he was playing football or were you still hustling? No, I've never hustled. I was a model. And then, so I told you when I went to London, I ended up doing Pretty Polly. I was a special, it's a bit embarrassing talking about my modeling days now, but I did Special K. I used to earn like £70 an hour. And like when I met Ashley, I had £72,000 in my bank account because I saved all my money, which then was an awful lot of money. That's a few hundred, few hundred grand now. Yeah. So, um, and then when Ashley left Leicester, I then, he was then, he went to crew. I couldn't, I didn't want to live in London anymore. The minute I met Ashley, I spent more and more time in Leicester. Then I used to travel for work. Then I went, to, then he went to crew. And I'd, I'd, I'd still do some modeling. I would do boot campaigns. I went boots as in the chemist, not, not boots on your feet. Jockey underwear, did a lot of swimwear. I was in an agency called Boss Model Agency in Manchester as well, which were still a really good agency today. Um, but what I found myself, I remember getting a job for, for jockey I was at Boots doing a big photo shoot in the south of France and it was really decent money. And I actually lied and put a, got my auntie to put a plaster on me. My auntie worked at Hope Hospital. I got to put a plaster on my leg and say I broke my leg so I didn't have to do it because I just couldn't stand being away from her. And I just thought of the longer we spent together, I didn't want even five days. I used to get churns in my stomach. Um, and then once we got married and we went on our honeymoon, I got pregnant on my honeymoon. And so then obviously I became a housewife and a mother and then that was when he was at Norwich and then we he then went from Norwich to Derby County but while he was at Derby County was it Derby County what was the next one after Derby oh when he moved to Barnsley we then moved back in with my mum and dad and that's how I started business I started my business career what did you do so my dad was always been in the building trade so Ashley had always wanted to live in Cheshire and I went to buy a big house in Bolton because that's where I was, sort of grew up. And I think, so Ashley's background is, his dad is really hard work and his dad uh, works on, is, is on the mines. And then years later, he, it's a very similar story to my parents actually. Um, his dad was an only child like I am. Um, Terry's mum, one day came home from school and she disappeared and ran off with somebody in the pub. And his dad at the time was in the army so he lived with his nana and he never saw his mum again. He was only, I think, 11 in Yorkshire, Yorkshireman. Um, and he's, Ashley's granddad was a massive figure in Ashley's life. And I feel so fortunate that I got to meet him. I did get to meet Ashley's granddad. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen Ashley cry when his granddad died. Um, but um, when his granddad came out of the army, he, he then... He was sort of, Terry was brought up by his, his auntie, sorry, should I should say his auntie, and, and then obviously when his dad came out, his dad. But then he was a miner, then he got his own business, and he sold ward engineering. God, I want to, this isn't factual, I couldn't tell you the actual dates, but I, I want to say the early 70s for a, money that would be worth fortunes today. But he was the same as my dad. My dad nearly lost everything. I've seen my dad crying with scabs on his head because of the stress of business and nearly and putting his house and his whole life on the line for his business and having bad times and good times. And I sort of saw my parents stick together through all those bad times and good times. And that's the same with Ashley's parents. We've got very similar upbringings. Uh, our parents are very similar in the way they brought us up as well. His mum, even though she's... I would say she's a lot more gentle than my mum, but that's probably just in public. Maureen was a strong woman. You know, she had good morals with Ashley. 
um, they, they, he went to private school, he went to William Hume. He was very sporty. Uh, Ashley was different than me. Ashley, you know, got his GCSEs, or O-levels, because he's older than me. Didn't do GCSEs when Ashley was there. Then he went on to be apprentice at Man City. Made the first team, I think, when he was 17. Broke his leg. His dad went everywhere with him. Supported him his football from being a really young boy. I guess seeing my parents do all that from nothing, I remember we'd... He wanted to live in Cheshire, I wanted to live in Bolton. Um, Ashley was adamant we wanted to live in Cheshire. So we went round trying to find a house in Cheshire. At this point, it was making half decent money. But everything we looked at, we just couldn't afford. So then we came across a barn in Mobberley. Um, and it was 170,000. But it was, a, it was a barn, like literally a barn with animals in it. So we had planning permission. So I was pregnant at the time with my second daughter, Taylor. Um, and we were living at my mum and dad's again. We always go back to my mum and dad's with, like, with all the family. And um, my dad said, well, well, I'll help you build. Oh, I went out to get prices from builders, but it was just too expensive. Um, so we said, right, well, my dad said, I'll do it. We'll do it together. So my dad did it. My dad got some of his workmen, different workmen. I managed it. Ashley managed it. He used to finish training. And we finally finished it and we called it Ashdown Barn. Uh, I was climbing up ladders at eight months pregnant with Taylor to check on the builders and stuff and my dad wasn't there. And both me and Ashley together, we learned about building because a lot of the people we had on day rates, you have to keep your eye on them. And we finished it. And then, um, so we, we moved into, into, the, into the barn. And then... I had a friend when we lived in London, when we lived in Oldham, which was the first house we did actually. We just did a little renovation on that, but not nothing like Ashton Barn. We, as soon as we finished, we spent all year painting doors myself and everything. This was another barn, but it was like a bed and breakfast, so it was a livable house. You could live in it and do it up. Sorry, I could have dragged you back again. And uh, I just literally put the. I'd finished the house. It took us a year to do it because we had no money then. Nothing like the next contract. I just put the Christmas tree up and put the final ball on the Christmas tree and Ashley rang me from training and said, Norwich City have come in for me and we're going for talks today. I was like, what? I've just finished the house. I went with him. I stayed in the hotel while he went for discussions. The following day they signed him. I never even came back to Oldham. My parents packed the house and moved us to Norwich. So then from Norwich then we went to Derby County and we lived in Duffield. And from Derby County... We went to, um, hang on a minute, Norwich, Leicester, Crew, Norwich, Norwich, Derby County, Derby County to Barnsley, which was his best club. Why? He just flew. He just, the manager, Danny Wilson, who is still a friend of ours now. In fact, Danny sent him a video message on his 50th. I got all the managers to send. Danny said, what a lovely guy. He just did really well. He was one of the top scorers. Um, he scored uh, and then at the time, Blackburn Rovers, which back then was Jack Walker, offered four and a half million, which the transfer in the whole country was seven million, which I think was Chris Sutton at the time. Yeah, he went to Blackburn. Yeah, but, but then, so they were, he, he replaced Chris Sutton, basically. I think he had Sutton and Shearer back then at Blackburn yeah, for a few yeah. years. So Brian Kidd, who is, who is an unbelievable, beautiful gentleman, was the manager and he, they signed Ashley. And um, so then we started to do the house. We did the house up. And I remember everything was hunky-dory. We had a gorgeous barn. It was all finished. We had a perfect life. We had two children. And then the girls were calling around and playing around the house. And I just thought to myself, when I was in Oldham, I met a lady called Maggie. She, she had a, um, an animal sanctuary. But the way she made the money, she had nursing homes. And she made a fortune. I thought, I really want one of them nursing homes. I want to buy a nursing home. Ash was at training, I had no idea. So I got hold of Grimley's, who sold businesses at the time, and I said, I'm looking at purchasing a nursing home. So they said, okay, it, what do you want to spend? I said, well, I gave them a budget. When I gave them the budget, we went looking around at different ones. There was one in Oldham, there was three residents in it, Stunker P. I went looking at another one, there was seven residents, Stunker P. Then I went to look at one in Bolton, so I'm going back to where my life started. Life started on Bromwich Street called Aberfields. And it was Mr. and Mrs. Bell. 
and it had it was 80 percent occupancy 590,000 so Ashley's like why do you I said I'll make it work you know what you don't know how to run a nursing home so I'll learn I just got a good feeling for buying a nursing home will do well and I want to do it. I want to have a business. I want to do something other than be at home and look after my children and cook dinner. I can look after the children, cook dinner, clean the house and still run a business. Did you struggle with the stay-at-home wife? No, it's not, that I, it's not that I struggled with it. You just wanted to do something more I just, productive? I could have my house cleaned. Mm -hmm. I used to take Ashley's pants off him when he came home from work and put him in the washer. I've got OCD. <laughs> I'm Honestly, I'm the most OCD person ever. I cook all the time now. I've still got the same OCD. But it wasn't enough for me. I could look after two children, I could bath them, I could take them to the park, I could do all the things, I could clean my house, I could cook, and I still had too much time on my hands. I could do something, I had space to do something else, and I wanted to do something where I could get my own teeth into it. I don't want to be just reliant on Ashley, I want to be able to bring an income in for our family as well. So that was sort of, I've always been active. Um, so I eventually... We approached the bank. Ashley, think we had 150,000 savings, and I said to Royal Bank of Scotland, "I want to buy this nursing home." They said, "Okay, you can buy it on the provision that you stay, the owners stay on for two years." So the owners agreed to stay on, and off I went. Dropped the children off at nursery, went to the nursing home, and it was literally a couple of weeks. It was done. We owned Abbeyfields, and I'd go into work, and Mr. and Mrs. Bell were the best teachers ever. And the reason I say that, they were so stingy with certain things. They were, the, they were the master. He once actually said to me, right, if your toaster breaks, don't buy a new one. I'll show you how to smolder a toaster together. Oh, no, you don't, you know, you don't, um, you, you don't have to give them big hot meals at night because they just like a sandwich and a cup of tea at night. I'm thinking, anyway, what I did learn from them was good business and look after the pounds sorry look after the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves so after six months I did everything I wanted to learn everything from washing the residence to office work to I went on courses I did first had because what I never wanted to do was have a business where somebody within my business knows more than me so it wasn't a nursing home sorry it was a care home so we didn't have nurses we had carers but quite advanced we used to take EMI elderly mental infirm um, and it was back in the day when you had social services had their own care homes as well. So after six months, I did six days a week there. I used to drop, get get the children ready for nursery, give them the breakfast, clean the house, put the wash in, drop the kids off, shot to Bolton, work, leave the nursing home, pick the girls up from nursery, come home, cook the dinner, do a bit of ironing at the night time. I was just, and then I, Ashley would say to me at one o'clock in the morning, we, we've not watched a film I'm like just one minute I just want to get these shirts done and what started to happen is I had no time for him because I was working that many hours and because I don't I can't just come home and just leave that lounge a bit messy and we can do it tomorrow he'd say leave that we'll, we'll empty the dishwasher in the morning I'm, I can't do it it's not my personality I like everything tidy so after six months the bank I went back to the bank and said I do really don't need the owners on they came back in, the bank had a look at it, and they agreed to release them after six months. And, they, and we, we stayed friends for years, Mr. me and Mr. and Mrs. Bell. So when they left, what I decided to do was from everything they taught me, I picked up the things that I thought were very, very important, but I dropped some of the things that they did. I started to do things with the residents. I started to, I mean, Ashley would come home from training, and I'd have five of them in my kitchen <laughs> in Mobley. <laughs> I'd used to, like, give them a glass of wine in back in my car and take them to the traffic centre. I struggled at first because when I'd lose residents, you'd get really upset because you'd get attached to them. But what I started to learn was that you had to keep your, bed, your beds full. So when I, what I said for Mr. and Mrs. Bell, we ran on 80% occupancy. It was, a, it was a profitable business. I then changed things to make things what I think we could add value to. And long the short of it, I bought next door, we extended to 36 bed. I bought the business of, for 520000 I sold it five years later for just over two and a half million with 100% occupancy in a waiting list. And I became probably the best care home in, in the Northwest. The biggest mistake I ever made was selling it though. Wait, did you say that? Just because, oh. Did it not so, feel like one of your babies oh no. kind of building no, it from no. scratch? I've just because of that much going on in my life. Well, I've got the care home and I'm going. Um, 
we lived in Cheshire, I used to shop at this job, this shop called Zigzag. So I'd been in and bought like a nice designer pair of pants, but I needed them altering. So the following week, I went back to Zigzag to say, to put my pants up, the shop had gone. I was like, where the bloody hell's the shop gone? Where's me? I've not put my pants up. But I knew they owned the shop over the road, which was a slightly older crowd, an older shop. Went over to the older shop, said, yeah, I've got a pair of trousers in Zigzag. The shop's closed. So the owner came down, Sandy, and she said, oh, don't worry, your pants are here. Got talking to her, went for a coffee with her. By the time I picked the trousers up and gone home, I bought the shop. So I'd gone into business with her. Well, not business, I kept her on as an employee. So Ash come home from training one day, I bought a care home. A year and a half, two years later, he came back and I bought a shop. He's like, why do we need a shop? I just said, I want one, I just think it'll work. I think fashion, da da da, I'll get to know people in Cheshire. Anyway, he's always good at actually let me go ahead with it. And then Sandy took me to buying all over Europe. We opened it, I rebranded it and called it Apparel. The worst business for making money I've ever done in my entire career, but the best thing I ever did. So then I've got all the nice clothes. I've got all the, all the, the big hitters in Cheshire coming in the shops. So you start chatting to people. You start getting to know who everybody is. And then one day the landlord came in and I'll never forget. He was a real ladies man. If he's listening, he'll agree with me. He's called Robert Bilton. And, um, I had a great figure in them days, a great body. And I was always, my, I basically never made money out of the shop because I was always taking the stock myself. So I spent half the time trying on the garments that I'd bought for the customers. And uh, he came in and he was like, all oh, flirty. And he did property, but he did commercial property. And I thought, I really want to get this loads of money to be made in property. I really want to get into property. So I told Ashley, I said, he's a right womanizer. I'm going to get a bit flirty with him, get, in, get into his head and find out how you get into this property. So I used to meet him, go over to Bistro, he used to try and charm me. I kept going with it. We became good mates, me and Robert, in the end. And so did him, him and Ashley. So then I decided I don't want to do commercial. And I had this vision that I wanted to have a business. I built houses that when you put the sign up, it was a pair, like a pair of Armani jeans in the shop. It had, the people knew before the house was built what they're going to get because built and ward was going to be. We, I did things like put TVs in bathrooms before anybody else, put lounges in kitchens. And we just started to buy up farms, get planning permission, build the house, and we'd always sell them off plan. And before we know it, within a couple of years, I was flying. We were doing so well, making a lot of money. We built Wayne Rooney, bought one of our houses. Kevin Campbell, I did a lot of footballers' houses back in the day. A lot of footballers bought them off us. Um, and then along the way... This was becoming a lot more. And then I got a manager in it because Abbey, Abbeyfields needed my time. I got a lovely manager called Anne Collins. It was incredible. And I just could leave that business alone because she was a great manager. And then what was my biggest worry, because Anne wasn't a spring chicken, is when, any, when Anne was ready to retire, I didn't have the capacity to start taking and being hands-on like I have been for the previous five years. So that was a decision I sold that. But what I did, I ended up giving the shop to my bookkeeper at the time, Claire Sudweeks, because it because it just couldn't it wasn't a great business for making money. But what that did by having apparel, it put me on the map in Cheshire that everybody knew who I was. So when I was then went went on to sell houses, I then became a bit of a name in Cheshire, and then knew I was a footballer's wife. We then go out with I'd go out with the likes of Wayne and Colleen Rooney, Leanne and Wes Brown, you'd go out with and you then became to become a somebody in Cheshire. And I, I guess, without sounding big-headed, I became a very well-known somebody in Cheshire back in the day. And it all stemmed from having that shop. So while the shop made me no money, it put me on the path to do greater things later on. Who was that? When was that moment you realised from the kid who was working in a bar, staying herself in London, trying to survive, to then building properties and being sh rubbing shoulders with the elite? I've always expected it. I've never thought anything different. Did you always believe it? Did always you understand thought, it I actually thought I was going to be an actress and be in Hollywood, to be honest. I started off wanting to be a pastry girl. My mum used to say to me, what do you want to be? And I'm going to tell you, and this is, I'm going to be totally honest. So I always wanted to be a pastry girl. So my mum my my mom said, can you not tell me what to do somewhere else? Because we should go out for me. I was like, oh, I want to be a pastry girl. I want to be a pastry girl. Um... But I went, I then, I did I did shoot for The Sun, actually. I did do one shoot for The Sun newspaper. With Beverly Goodway. 
it didn't because there was no internet then. They'd have to go back in their archives a long way. <laughs> uh, one of the press, when I very first joined Housewives, The Sun, said to me, oh, well, you believe you're quite well known in The Sun. And I thought, and I'll never forget, cause, but before I joined The Housewives, which I'll get into in a, shortly, the one, first thing I did was make sure with all the children, let the children know, there's topless pictures of me out there. Uh, I wasn't ashamed of it. I was dead proud. I used to do like signings and open nightclubs and everything. Uh, in fact, by the way, Ashley was a footballer. I asked him who was the one that got him and all his friends into the nightclubs and got him to the front of the queue. It wasn't him, it was me. So, um, no, I've always believed, and this is what I've done. I've, I've, now, I've always had a vision that when I'm older, I'm going to have a big house. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a Hollywood star. I didn't quite get to Hollywood. Didn't quite get, I always wanted to be an actress. Uh, I've always loved performing. Obviously, later on in life, me, me, it, I sort of did end up on TV, so I did sort of achieve my dream in that way. But I guess I'm very ambitious. And if I lost everything tomorrow, I'll start again. I'm, I'm never faced by anything. Fighting mentality. You said you never drank to 31. Why did you start drinking? Well, it's not that I started drinking. I'd have the odd drink. I just didn't really like the taste of it, really. Um... I didn't really go out a lot. I don't really go out a lot now, to be honest. Uh, I'd, I've not seen I didn't drink. I'd have the, I'd get drunk maybe three times a year. I'd have a blast out once, three times a year, but most of the time I'd, I was the driver. How uh, important is that for business to kind of be on the path and staying? No, it's important, listen, drinking. I've drunk way too much when I was on Housewives and into a point where even I could see you're going to have a problem if you don't do something about it and slow it on TV. And, um, but my family would never allow me to be like that. And like now, oh God, there's so much to tell you. I need to go back. To the, I need to, back last we need to go back really. Yeah. Then I can tell you about the drinking and stuff like that. But, um, so again, being in Cheshire, I, um, I met lots of people, I knew lots of people, lots of footballers, wives, obviously, because I was one myself. It was back in the day when we were, everyone was called wags, and um, and I sort of never wanted to be. Well, first of all, I don't believe in the word wag, if I'm honest with you, because I know a lot of the girls who are footballers' wives. But secondly, I always wanted to be my own independent person, and I wanted to be known as that as well. Um, because I always knew with football, it's a short career. So in my head, I was always stressing that this fabulous life, these flash cars, these designer outfits, one day the tap's going to be switched completely off and those days are finished. There's no slow process where you can get yourself ready. It stops overnight. So I sort of always had that in the back of my mind. And me and Ashley, because Ashley's always been an entrepreneur, like I said, we do everything together. We always knew that one day that, that day is going to finish and we wanted to continue the standard of living that we had then with the football money so the only way to do that is to start in businesses so that's why we, we started you know um and i guess obviously you, I, I got to know everybody in cheshire i got offered things constantly i was constantly being offered tv roles um lots honestly weekly i'd be asked off different people do i want to do tv work it never interests me why he just didn't, just didn't want to be on TV. And then a friend of mine, Darren Little, who was the um, a producer on Coronation Street, EastEnders, I actually met him through Denise. We met at Denise Welsh's wedding, actually. And we got on like a house on fire. And he was actually doing, do you remember the show, Footballers' Wives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I often, that was a classic show. I often yeah. get referred, by the way. I'm hoping it's just the... Uh, the deep voice, but I'm always getting referred to. Is it Tanya? What was she called? Tanya? Blonde girl. Yeah. Not I'm case. All, yeah, there exactly. is a resemblance, if I'm honest. Yeah. <laughs> Always, and uh, yeah, so he actually was the, he was the producer on that. He was like, "I should cash you for that." I'm like, "I'm not going on that. I'm not an actress. I'm not." Because obviously that was scripted, uh, and we became friends. Um, and yeah, so I got a call, and I'd, whenever I'd been asked to do stuff like, Endemol approached me once to do my own show. I, I was always being asked. I'd always speak to them, like, listen to what they're going to say and then politely say no because I'm a big believer in don't burn your bridges. So I remember I was away with um, my friends, John and Claire Caldwell. We'd been away in, in America and um, I totally forgot that I'd agreed to see these producers about this some 
some reality show they're going to make in Cheshire. I didn't, couldn't even remember the name of it, but I totally forgot. Got off the aeroplane, completely jet lagged, fast asleep in bed. A housekeeper comes upstairs and said, there's, there's a lot of producers downstairs waiting to speak to you. I was like, what? Come down in my onesie, looking like from in Derek, not Dawn, because I'm a look I've been travelling all night, and I was absolutely knackered. So I thought, oh, I just thought, I'll just see him, pacify them for five minutes. Anyway, it was Darren. Darren was there. I was like, Darren, what are you doing here? So anyway, they started to tell me about the show they're going to be doing. It's called The Real Housewives of Cheshire, da, da, da. Um, and the more I chatted to them, and I just started to think, my girls are at an age now, I think they were 16 and 18 at the time, give a year or two. If ever I can help them and give them a platform, now's the time. And the biggest thing for me going on that show, that was the first. The second biggest thing was I trusted Darren Little. So I thought, I spoke to my family about it, because one thing, I wouldn't do any show without having their blessing, because obviously they were going to be involved in it. We spoke about me, some, like, some topless pictures come out of me. We, and then the whole family, it was a collective decision. We decided, let's go for it and let's do it. Never did I think for one minute it would become as big as it did and as fast as it did. Uh, and I must say, it's the best decision I ever made. Um, just because it's been done really well for my family, for my kids. Um, but I'm a big believer in life, you shouldn't have any regrets. You learn by your mistakes. What did you do on it, 12 seasons? Was it 13 or 12? Yeah, 12, I think. How yeah. was it after the first season went? How was the response? Oh, it's unbelievable. I struggled for the first couple of seasons because, like, I'll never forget Darren Little saying to me, listen, Dawn, if you go on a reality show, you've got to listen to me as a friend. If you be yourself, you'll win. Because the camera never lies. It will always catch out if you try and play up to camera. Just be yourself. If, you know, the person you are, if you're upset, you can cry. If you're angry, you can laugh. But be yourself. And that's sort of what was my motto all the way along. And I don't think a lot of people that I work with on that show can 100% say they're like that. But I was a bit of a Marmite character, really, and I am in real life, that I'll always wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, if you back me in a corner, I'm an only child, and I'm the parents of Lynn and John Burke, you need a very big army to take me down. But if you stab me in the head with a knife, and when it's in my head, you say, you're sorry, and you really mean it, I'll pull it out and say, don't worry about it. And that's how I am as a person. I'm very, I do really wear my heart on my sleeve. Uh, and then things got pretty tough for me in season five and six. And then I was going through some um, medical illness, uh, medical issues where I had a lump in my stomach. Um, and that we needed to go. I needed to have a full hysterectomy. Uh, I was having rows with certain cast members on the show. And I remember going, because I didn't want to worry Ashley and the kids too much. I remember like, I had my hysterectomy booked in. I remember crying at night thinking, what if I die? What if I've got cancer? I had all this stress going on the show. So then I pulled out the trip. I was supposed to go to Dubai to film for Housewives. And I just said, at the first time in my life I felt weird because I just can't do it. I can't go. I'm physically not mentally... I can't, I can't do it. I felt I, I was attacked from every angle. I felt weak. So then I never went. And then I went to, I'm not going to talk about cast members on the show because I don't think that's fair because I'm not here to respond. I'm not going to speak about anybody in particular. I have got some amazing friends, you know, on the show and I'm, I'm friends with the majority of the cast and I still am today. And they're all great girls, uh, majority of them. Um, but, so I, booked, I got booked in for my hysterectomy and I went into theatre and I was in theatre seven hours. Uh, thank God I had my hysterectomy because when they tested the... I had lots of things going on. It, it, um, it wasn't cancerous right then as, is, as in then life-threatening, but it would have turned cancerous had it had not been removed. So I did the right thing. And um, it was a major operation. I mean, there was things said on the show that Oh, she's using a hysterectomy. And, I mean, how can you use a hysterectomy as a, as a storyline? It was, it's a pretty major operation, a hysterectomy. But anyway, I came out of my hysterectomy and I resigned from the show. And when I resigned, I was never, ever going to go back. And we lived and breathed the show. I give my all to the show. I'm, you know, I, I tried to be vulnerable. I tried to show the real me. 
I tried to sell the crazy me. There was things that I showed on the show that I didn't particularly like what I saw. Uh, I think I touched on it before. I started to drink quite a lot because you drink when you're filming a lot. And I'm not saying the show makes you do that because they don't. People will often say to me about The Real Housewives, is it scripted? Nobody can make me say anything I don't want to say. So anything that comes out of my mouth, I'm not going to blame the producers, the show, because I'm, I'm, I'm an adult. It's not scripted. It's far from scripted. Um, people say, do they encourage you to drink? No, they don't. You just get in that atmosphere with a load of girls. And, you, and one week goes to another week, and you then just start drinking more. And the, I would say the only times I feel I've had regrets and let myself down on camera is when I've been filming and I've been drunk. Um, Do you feel as if that's fair to be getting cast members drunk where no, I don't they're, think they're, they're more not, vulnerable? I even, listen, I know they're not forcing you, but... No, they're not, they're not even encouraging you. So let me just make it really clear. Every cast member on there, it's their choice whether you want to drink or not. And in actual fact, sometimes they go, please stop drinking, you're drinking too much, you're slowing on camera. So they don't, so I don't want that to come across. Because everyone thinks that, and that is not the case. Every single person on there is drinking because they want to drink. Because you get carried away, you're with a load of girls, you've had a row... You're having a bit of a laugh. It is a night out. It is a... So, yeah, they don't... They, in actual fact, they're the opposite. They, did your family know you were going in for that operation? How long did you keep that to yourself? No, or? they knew I was going in for the operation. How much was that a concern of life? Not life or death, but it could have been that way where potentially... Well, it could have been can Yeah, you know, of course, if you've got then, to be honest. Yeah. But how was, was that was, extra stress in your life knowing that there's a chance you might not have been here? No, I didn't even... I don't think I've told them today. Why? to protect him well no I didn't really need to at the time I didn't want to worry them they know that I had something in there that was uh, that if I didn't if I hadn't have removed it could have could have been mm -hmm. but, but but just to make it clear that has no bearing on anything else in my body it was just that one isolated area um, but um, yeah and I think so I ended up resigning from the show um, leading up to my hysterectomy, I had like pus coming out of my eyes. I was so, I was in such a bad place, really run down. Had my operation, went to have respite at my parents' house, didn't come back to my own home. My mum said, let me look after you for a week, so I did. Um, my producer was ringing me every two minutes, Mike Swindell, saying, please, you know, you, you can't resign, you can't resign, you're a big part of the show. And I just didn't want to go back. And I don't know what it was. I think I came out of my hysterectomy and Ashley spoke to me and my kids and they said, you can't just give up like that. So then I went back on the show and I went back a very different person than, than the person they last seen. And I just like went, anyone that messes with me now, you're going to see the real me. I'm not going to worry about worrying about your friendship or my friendship. You know, I will be the person I am. If you want to take me on, if you want to be that person, then like I said, I'm bring a big army you all th a couple of you thought you could get together and make me feel very vulnerable while i'm back and i i fought quite a lot for a few seasons and then uh did you feel as if you were getting attacked when you were vulnerable not attacked i felt there was a couple of cast members that thought they pushed me out by look watch the show make your own opinion how big she is it because on camera it was very it could be intense so how much of that was reality all reality or no, set up no there's none of it set up this is what i keep telling people it's completely it's it's not scripted at all look they'll put you in a scene where you'll have to talk about us they'll say right we, we, i need you to tell such a body this and then that's it that's they'll guide you and then they leave you alone so there's not you know because you've only got a week to film so um no i think the, being on a reality show one of the things that i did open my eyes to in People get very competitive. For fame? Attention? Yeah, not for fame, maybe, but for storylines. For You can get, sometimes they get, um, and... Do you know a lot of people lose their self in reality shows? I did myself, not just, like, 100%, yeah. But it's not actually reality, it's like an, another bubble. i tell you what, I can only speak for myself, because I wouldn't, like I said, the girls are great on the cat, I wouldn't dream of even speaking about a particular cast member. Because uh, ultimately, whether I liked somebody or I didn't like somebody, for me, you have to, I'm on a reality show, I'm with a production company, I'm with a, a, a cast, and there has to be a mutual respect there, whether you like them or you don't, that I'm a big believer that if you're going to talk about an individual, they need to be there to yeah. respond. Plus everybody was playing their part to create entertainment as well. Yeah, and we had a great show because we had strong women on it. 
But the question you just asked me, what was the question you just asked me? The reality of real life and... No, getting lost. Mm -hmm. What I started to do is forget about my family, think I'm a bit, I am, going out a lot. Because you like people coming over to you, it's a nice feeling, you like... Um, I'd, I'd go out more, I'd be going out more, I'd be going out to bars more, I'd, I'd be mingling more with people, I'd be going out with the cast. And thankfully I had the family that I've got, because I don't think... I'm actually put up with a lot. I'd say I'd be home at 10 o'clock and I'd roll in at half five in the morning, you know, and I did it a lot. Uh, it wasn't well, for a long period of time. Um, and then, yeah, I then, especially in my last season, I then started to really understand what my life is about. It's not about being on TV. It's not about... Because you, you have that many people saying you're great, coming up to you saying you're so lovely, nothing like you are on TV, you're great. Oh, it's Dawn Ward and the cat. Oh, my God. And don't get me wrong, it's lovely. And I'm regardless, even now, I still get people coming up to me. I will never, ever not do a picture, whether I'm a meeting, whether I'm doing, I'm busy doing something, I will always give somebody... Because it means a lot to them. But, so, I have an amazing... I had an amazing following... The fans were amazing with me. I was, I didn't think I'd be liked as much as I was, to be honest, because I'm quite a strong character. But I had so many great fans. I still have today. But what I did, I started to think I was it. I think I started to forget who I am, really. And I think I'm bigger. I thought I was thinking in my head, I'm this star, I'm going out, I'm doing this. And I'm, and you start getting carried away with the whole thing. It's a fake lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and actually, I've got a family at home. Businesses. My family and everything, my fam, everything I've ever done in my life is to my family. I joined the show for the girls, but I just got lost. But only it wasn't for a long time. I got lost, and thankful my family is strong, and they put, they brought me straight back down to earth. Um, and that's exactly what they did. Um, so obviously you've been through the show for years. It was a massive success. What was the reason why you left that time and never came back? Right. So. I was always planning that, that one day I'm going to leave. Obviously, I've got my family. Um, but I think every season I'd say I was going to leave, every single season. I think it's my last season. But I was so addicted to the show and addicted to the cause. And I lived and breathed Housewives. And I had some, some amazing times. And I feel so grateful for the times that I had on there. But I was almost addicted to it because... I, had a, I felt a responsibility for the show because I was such a big character on the show and the producers were amazing and, and they sort of like, I felt I'd let them down if I left because I was, because I was a big character and because I was always involved in the drama or I felt I'd be letting people down if I left, you know. So every season, my family say, this is your last season, I'd say, I'm going to do one more. And then... I'd just been finishing one of my biggest jobs, well, the biggest job I've ever done, so I haven't even spoke about my career yet, about me being what my real job is in interior design. I'll have to get onto that before I finish because that is actually my real job and the reason I live in, in Warford Hall. Um, and I'd, I'd just finished um, John Caldwell's house in Mayfair, which was a huge project, £200 million project. I was fortunate um, that he gave me the opportunity. John's had a really big influence on my life. You know, we've done a lot of work together. He's sort of one of my mentors in business. I talk about parents. He's, he has been uh, pretty amazing. I've actually got another friend. I've got to say this because in business and stuff, um, Terry and Nikki are friends of mine from Jersey. There again, another bit of influence in my life. But John's one of those people that never gives you a leg up because you're his friend. In an actual fact, he's the opposite. If you're his friend, it's harder to get one of his jobs. So um, he had every single interior designer in London pitch for this most expensive house in the UK, Britain's most expensive home. Uh, and all the top designers, he had, I think, some designers from Europe. Uh, I eventually won the job, and I was on it for four and a half years, and it was an incredible job, made fair house. You've probably seen it, so I've been on TV on documentaries. Britain's most expensive house. So I was the lead designer on that, and it was a really hard 
job. I was saying, he was great to work for because he has a lot of trust in me, which made me want to work even harder for him. You know, when you've got a client that says, if that's what you think, we'll go for it. I'm like busting everybody's bollocks behind me because we have to, because he's put that much trust in me. So it was the final week of the job. And I've been on it for nearly five years, this job, 6,000 drawings. And um, I, it was getting signed, the final sign off. And actually I was going away with Nikki and Terry, my friends, they've got a place in Tenerife. And the following day after me seeing John Cordwell and getting this job that we've, the whole team have worked five years on, I think let's, if I do this and John Cordwell loves it, I'll have a quick meeting with my agent. And then I'm going to Tenerife in the morning. Went to meet John, the meeting went amazing. He was delighted. Went to meet my agent. Um, I'll tell you what happened. I'd, I'd, I'd had an ulcer in my mouth and I'd been on a drug called Metrodizal, which you're not supposed to drink alcohol on. And I went to meet my agent and I was with one of my team at the time because she'd been in the meeting with me. I had two glasses of wine only. I was really slurry. I mean, even I can have a lot more than two glasses of wine before I slur. I was really, really slurry, but in a great mood. So I said goodbye to my agent, Mark, because um, I was on the 740. So I said, I, want, um, I had a girl called Jenny work for me at the time. She was staying in London to do some finalisation with the job. And I said, right, I'm going away tomorrow. I'll see you. Jumped on the, in the car for my, to get the 740 home. When I arrived at the station, it was absolutely heaving. So there's some kind of problem. You couldn't move on the con concourse, is it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'm feeling a bit tipsy, but I'm also, I'm, a, I'm on such a high. I've just signed off the biggest job of my life. It's done. I've achieved it. As soon as I jump off that, get up in the morning, I'm going on holiday. Job done. So I'm in a really good mood. And I've seen these two boys and this girl arguing with the customer services girl. But this one lad in particular, he was screaming his head off. So I went over and I was like, come on, just leave her. I said, it's not her fault. I said, look, we're all, we're all delayed. There's no one, just leave her alone. I said, leave. I know you, you with your Botox face um, on that show. Do you know what? I'm the kind of person, if you go at me, I'll go back at you. But that day, I honestly, he could have said what he wanted. Nothing could have made me in a bad mood. I was in just on a high. And he went, who do you think you are with all your wealth? So I leant forward and I tapped him and I went, well, at least I'm going on first class because I'd rather like to say something to him like that. He went, I'll show you. You've just called me a Jewish cunt. I went, what? He said, you've just called me a Jewish cunt. I said, what are you talking about? I had no idea the guy was Jewish, by the way. So he said, I'll show you. Watch this. So we then rings 999. So the next thing... I'm now knowing, because I've been in court and been accused before. I just think, I, I, know the, I know the script, especially when you're on TV. So now I start to panic. So I went to his brother and I was like, will you just let him know I've not said that? And then he went, I've heard you. I was like, what? So then I went to his girlfriend, who I didn't know it was his girlfriend at the time, because she seemed like a bit quieter and a bit more like she would be reasonable. And I said, please, will you please tell him? I haven't said that. Have you heard me say that? And when I really did panic is when she didn't look me in the eye. She looked straight at her feet and said, I heard you as well. And at that point, I thought, fuck, I am in trouble here now because I've got three people saying I've said that. And especially in this day and age, anything to do with any kind of racism is a very serious issue. And it's something I'm very against. But for me to be accused of it, if I'm being honest, apart from being a paedophile or a rapist, I can't really think of pretty much worse things to be accused of. And <clears throat> so at this point, I started to panic. I was really crying. I'm thinking, oh, my God. So I thought, just get out of the way. If I step away from them, they'll just leave me alone. Just look the other way, you, you know. Anyway, the next thing I know, the police turned up. Uh, at this point, I'm really crying by this point. And I'm saying, but I haven't said it. I, didn't, I don't know he's Jewish. How will I know he's Jewish? Um... Anyway, long story short, because it's quite, I'd rather speak to you about the court case rather than the incident. They then take me to the police station, arrest me, put me in handcuffs. Um, the week before... Handcuffs? Yep. Yeah, but the problem... Well, they took me to the station... Handcuffs on what? 
well, that's, this is what they did. So I was crying. They didn't hang come for me at first. This is the problem they got when they got to court because I don't understand the law. They took me to the, there's like a little station on Euston and they took me inside. And before all this, he was screaming his head off going, she's a racist, she's a racist. And I remember one of the train platform managers who was actually really nice. And thankfully he was there because he was the only independent witness came over and said, just say sorry to him. I said, but I haven't said anything. I can't, I haven't. He said, just get on the train and say sorry to him. I said, but I haven't said anything. So they take, when the policeman turned up, quite a junior officer, they take, they took me to, there's like a station at Euston, a police station. They were trying to tell me, this young man was trying to tell me to go in this room. I'm saying, I don't want to go, because it had no windows and claustrophobic. So I said, am I being arrested? because I need to know, and he said, am, I, am I being arrested? He went, go in that room. I said, no, am I being arrested? He went, do you want arrested? And they said, boom, he put handcuffs on me in the station. So then I was really panicking. I was like, please, I'm sorry. Just, I was, it was awful, honestly. It was the most traumatic experience. They then take, took me from there to, um, after which I thought they were taking me on, letting me go, after I told them, I explained the full story. I said, please look on the CCTV footage. Have you got any audio? I asked all those things. Um, but I promise you, I haven't said anything. I have. I didn't know he was Jewish. Why would I say that? How would you know he was Jewish? Uh, I told them what was... I said, go, go and ask the... Please go and ask the customer services lady. Anyway, the long and short of it is... That I thought they was putting me on a train. But the law says they can't put me on a train because they've arrested me and put handcuffs on me. Which apparently you, you can't take them off and... Once you arrested someone, there's a law in it anyway. I didn't know at the time. I thought I was going home. When I got to the bus on the steps, there was three police fans waiting for me. They put me in the back of a police van. Oh, God, it makes me upset. Um, I begged. I was begging them. I was like, please, 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 I beg you. Because I have got a real problem with claustrophobia. I did four years before I could go in a lift. Um, I was begging them, please, I'll do anything. Please just put me in the back of a van. Please don't put me in. I'm claustrophobic. And I, anyway, they put me in the back of a van and it had a piece of glass in it so the man on the other side could see me. Um, and they drove me to Wimbledon Police Station an hour. And then, so the week before, so I stopped smoking seven years, well, more than seven years ago. Um, I smoked vapes. Um, but occasionally, once, twice a year, year, I would have a cigarette, but... I'm talking one cigarette once, twice a year, because you can see I've got my vape. Since this, I've actually started smoking a bit again, which is a bit annoying, really. I need to slap it on the head. But, You'll get that again. Pardon? You'll get that again. Yeah. Um, but, um, so I have the creme ball, because my daughter nearly died, uh, Aston. God, there's so much I could tell you. I've not told you half my life story. I need like about... Three goals with you, to be honest, James. There's no rush. You don't, you don't even know about that. Listen, just take your time. Yeah, so I, my youngest daughter almost died of meningitis. What age? Uh, 16 weeks. She was born with pneumothorax, which is lungs burst. She spent the first four weeks on a life support machine. Then when she was 16 weeks old, she became... Um, she had got streptococcus septicemia. The doctor said she had less than, less than 50% chance. If she survived, it was 50% chance of brain damage, deafness and blindness. 85% chance of brain damage, deafness and blindness. As it happened, that day never came, thank God. Oh, good stuff. Um, but um, I decided I need to give back because she's the only child I've met with strep, me personally met. I'm not saying there isn't other children. And I've met a lot because I've done a lot, I do a lot of charity work. That hasn't got a severe disability of some sort from that kind of meningitis. It's not a contagious type. It's the one that you carry as a mother when you're carrying a baby. So I decided to do a one-off event. So I've got a big house, I've got a big garden. So we put together with what we call the creme, the creme de la creme ball. It was a one-off event we did on the front lawn of our house. It was 450. I never thought we'd sell a ticket. We sold 450. Long story short, 10 years on, I'm on my 10th. I was then on my 10th year of the creme ball and we hit just over a million pounds with trade for charity. When I do the creme ball, loads of people come in the house. People leave cigarettes around the house. They leave bottles. There's, I'm talking like a few hundred people come in the house from the marquee. And at the end of the night, my housekeepers, 
clear up. And if there's anything in the cigarettes, they stick them in the second drawer in my kitchen in the oven glove. So whenever I do have a cigarette, I don't need to buy cigarettes. I always say there's always, because they have the creme bowl, there's always or events. I have quite a few events in my house. There's always fags in the second drawer in the kitchen. Sometimes there might be two in it. Sometimes there might be 10 in it. Sometimes there might be a full packet. So as I was leaving that morning, I was late for the train. I said to my, my housekeeper, just chuck us a packet of fags. She chucked me a packet of fags, put them in the bag. And this is the thing that people don't think, because when you see what the press said about me, it said that I blamed my housekeeper for the next bit I'm going to tell you. She took me a packet of cigarettes. It's exactly what I asked her to do. I get to London. Uh, as it happened, I never got a chance to have a cigarette that day. Because I went to meet my agent, and before I knew it, I was back at the station. When I got to the station at Wimbledon, they said, can we check your bag? I was like, yeah, of course you can. They checked my bag. As they opened the bag, in the cigarette packet, there was... Well, I thought at the time it was cocaine, a packet, a packet of cocaine. When I actually got to court, it was the it wasn't it was an empty packet of cocaine that had, I think it was something like three pounds sixties worth. Okay, in so a, an empty bag. In a, yeah, well, a Cheshire empty bag probably. Yeah, glass Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now at the time when I was I was mortified, saying, "Please call my housekeeper." You have at this point, nobody knew I was arrested. I didn't spoke to my husband. I didn't spoke to my, anybody. I Why the fuck are they searching you? Because they asked me, they asked me could they? And I said, yeah, could, you can. Well, I was arrested then. I was arrested. I'd already been arrested for racial... Racial? What did I get arrested for now? Racial aggravated assault. But that got changed later on. <laughs> they first arrest, arrested me for drunk and disorderly, which I wasn't. I was complete, you know, I'd had a couple of drinks and, and I was slurry because I'd been on the metrodizal. Then well, Maybe that's why they've searched you because they, they maybe think you were on, on it. No, it wasn't a slurry where, no, no, it wasn't that, it wasn't that kind of slurry. It was like, I, I slur when I'm on TV when I've had a drink. My husband knows straight away. I just have a bit of a slurry in me because I've got nodules on my larynx, so I slur really easy. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe. I'm just saying it. I was completely confidentious. I was just very, very upset and panicking. So when I got to the station, and this, so I said, please, I, I don't smoke. I said, if you call my housekeeper now, ask her, do I buy cigarettes? Ask her, where do those cigarettes come from? Ask her, where did she find those cigarettes? From what events? I give them absolute chronological. I said, can you fingerprint them? Please fingerprint them. Anyway, so I was not going home then. Yeah, because at that time, if you're explaining that, it seems as if you'd explain at that time and you're if somebody's no, trying got, to, yeah it's true what you're saying but if the coppers are thinking i've got them for the house it will not make sense they think that you're making all that shit up you know because later on they promised me they would do it and they never did because i even begged them in the morning they kept me in the cell for 18 hours it was the most traumatic i've just told you i'm claustrophobic it was i mean they had to move somebody out of a cell because i'm not claustrophobic they didn't let me open the window so i could get my head out i mean honestly it was i just thought to myself how am I in the cell? I've done, I, I've done nothing wrong, and I'm locked up in a cell. It was honestly, it was the most traumatic thing ever. So I kept pleading with them because I was going on holiday. Obviously, never went on holiday. Thank God, though. The only my saving, my only saving grace is that had had they have not done that, I don't know if it's any. I don't know the law. 100% I was getting on an aeroplane the next day with that cigarette packet in my bag. Because I would have got home, not emptied my bag because I was flying the next morning to Tenerife. So I wouldn't have emptied my handbag. My handbag would have gone with the suitcase. And it could have been that they found it at the airport and that would have been, in my opinion, I don't know if it is, I'm sure it would have, could have been a much bigger deal. Oh, the papers would have made out you were drug smuggling. Yeah, so I suppose the night in the cell, me finding the fact that the cigarette, the cigarette packet had an empty bag of cocaine in it, prevented me from jumping on that plane and being at an airport. But there was fuck all in it anyway. They would, they would have seen many stuff like that at the airport. They'd probably been more lenient than the coppers. Yeah, so so I then, I did my interview the next day, pleaded with them to... Were you, you thinking, in the cells at that time, are you thinking somebody's called you a racist, they found a bit of gear, were you oh, thinking your life My life's over. My li Do you know what? If I'm being totally honest with you, even at that point, not that the drugs wasn't a serious thing. The racism was the only thing in my mind. It was the one and only, you know, even going to court, 
I'd have been devastated to be found guilty of the drugs because more because I didn't have any clue. But I would take that all day long to be to prove my innocence against racism. Yeah, a few gram in your pocket. Listen, it's nobody with a bat in an eyelid. As it's, it happens. It's fuck so all. when we get to court, it got. I mean, I had there was things like. How long did it? How long did it go on for before it went to court? Well, so we went into lockdown after that. So I lived with it over my head all through lockdown. Didn't tell anyone in the show. Um, when did it break in the press? Well, I'm going to tell you now. So, I, they didn't, they, while I got arrested, I wasn't charged. So my, you don't, I don't need to tell anyone because I've not been charged. I never thought for one minute I was going to get charged. I asked them to fingerprint the drugs. I asked them to get the CCTV footage. I, pl I pleaded with them to speak to the customer services lady. Just because he said, I'm saying, how on earth could I be charged for calling someone a Jewish cunt? Sorry, I don't even like saying it now. I'm, I'm scared of even saying it on the, even those words. These are That's what you're charged with saying? Yeah. So it's in public so, domain? So, uh, and there was other things said. There was things said that I said to the girl that she's a disease. I have never, not only have I ever do, said that to anyone. I've, I've, have you, I have never heard anyone call anyone a disease. Have you ever heard anyone say, yeah, you're know, a disease? I've never even means. heard of the saying. Yeah. But the lies between the three of them, there was, there was, I mean, it was terrible. But there was big, big points that I'm fortunate. I own, I own my life to a lot. A lot. My husband, right? He was, how, what he, he was incredible. There was, there's a couple of things I really need to get across. I went to court years before with Sunita, which is a boring old thing. The same scenario. Some, she said I did something. I didn't do it, and the proof was there. I didn't. Simon Cowes ex. Yeah, I'm not even going to waste my time talking about her. Like, cause she, I wouldn't give her the airtime, but she didn't turn up for the <clears throat> for the verdict. Put it that way. You know, I remember speaking to John Cordwell because there was when, before it broke in the press, sorry. So, because of my Sunita case, when I was, when I got out of the cell, my mum picked me up from the station. Nobody gets to speak to the barrister. You speak to a solicitor, then they get you a barrister. After my Sunita case, I got quite friendly with Lisa Judge. So we, we, we became friends after the, after the court. <clears throat> so I rang her and she said, come round to my house, get your mum to bring me straight here. She was amazing. And we sat, we had a couple of glasses of wine, just the two of us. We sat down, I cried and cried on the shoulder. And then she said, look, this is going to be tough for you. She said, but first thing I advise you, get a private investigator before anything, just to see what these people are about. So I did. Then she said, just in case, I don't think, you know, it's a 50-50, you're not going to... You'd hope not to get charged because there's not enough evidence. It's just his word. But unfortunately, he's got Free. His, his his yeah. brother. I said, yeah, but he knows them. Of course he's got them. But he's, it yeah, does, yeah. So <clears throat> when he gets to court, we finally find out he said things like, all police are pigs, all Muslims should be shot at birth, fuck the Germans, the stuff that we found out on him. And I was absolutely, I remember, I lived and breathed, she took me, Lisa, we did everything for, for a year and a half. I had to ring her every day because I was, it was on my mind every day. I was thinking, because, oh, so at the beginning I'd not been charged. And then I remember coming back from Manchester in a really good mood. And I was speaking to Ashley on the way home and never said anything. And I walked into the lounge and I was like, I was like, you need to sit down. I was like, what, what's the matter, what's the matter? Because at one point, one of the one of the police officers was saying, there's something not right about these boys. They know you're in business. They've got some kind of vendetta. So we never thought we were going to get charged because even the police officer was like, there's one of the police officers, a more senior one. So he said, yeah, they've charged you. And I just dropped on the floor. I was like, oh my God, because I know what's coming now I've got a court case I've got press it's going to be released in the press I've got to explain to my children um oh it was oh, honestly I cried all night um so then I sort of like after I didn't tell anybody else other than my close family because it's only because then we went to lockdown even though I've been charged we hadn't sat they hadn't sat court date um so it hadn't come out in the press and then it was when I was going to my first court um, Zoom 
because it was on Zoom, the first one. So going to court, my barrister said to me, it was magistrates, we can't go to magistrates. She said, it's going to cost a lot more money, darling. She said, but we need to go to a Crown Court because you need a jury. You might get one magistrate on the day, you might get three. But if they watch you on the show and they don't like you, they can just take, you won't get a fair trial for something as serious. This is what her advice to me was. So we took it to, and it kept getting adjourned adjourned yeah. so it was it was like torture for you for it went on for two years over my head so it's supposed to be a three-day court case and oh when it came out and the press got hold of it um i can't tell you i felt like my life had ended it was basic honestly it was awful i didn't get out of bed for three days i lay in bed and i was just like I've, got, I've still got a message on my phone now. It's a message my husband sent me. And it was along the lines, and I still read it now. Uh, in fact, I'm going to look at So when it broke in the press, this is how bad it was. And I knocked Donald Trump off the top spot in the Daily Mail. I mean, we can laugh about it now, but it was pretty traumatic. And I just thought my life's over, and I lay... And, I, I, and as much as I'm a confident person and I've always dealt head on with situations, when I'm really, really down, I hide and sleep. I don't want to speak to anybody. I go re When I go quiet, it means I'm really, really down. I do the opposite to what people think I would, I go in myself. And I've got some really, really good Jewish friends. Um, I've got, a, a, and he, he wrote a fabulous, it's David Lewis from London. David and Alexis Lewis are really good. And that was the thing. I was more panicking, not just about my reputation with the public, about the people that are friends of mine. I've got Jewish friends. You know, they wasn't just saying about, it's about Jewish people. It was, I'm a racist. So you, to everybody, you're a racist across the board. It was just all so overwhelming. It was like, and it's everything I've always been against, you know. Um, my son-in-law's a Muslim. I've got lots of Jewish friends, I've got black friends, I've got gay friends. I'm not, I don't judge anybody, I never have done. I've always been a very much people person where, you know, it's about the person, it's not about the religion, you know, when... But we're know, living in a day and age where everybody's walking in eggshells, but for me, no matter what race you are, no matter what sex you are, no matter what age you are, listen, if you're a cunt, you're a cunt. It's yeah, as simple yeah. as that, and that's yeah. life. And, and that's exactly what. I don't give a fuck who you are. If you're going to be a dick, I'm going to tell you you're a dick. It's nothing yeah. to do with your fucking. But I actually, that, that that day, the annoying thing is, that day, can I be honest with you? Yeah. Like, if I say the word cunt, I always say it to my friends laughing. I don't call. If I'm mad, it's not a word I ever use. You're a cunt. I'd say, you're a dick, you're a bitch, you're a. It's not a word I use when I'm, when I'm angry. Are you, I love the word, by the way, the word cunt. Let me just get that out there. Yeah, so does the Scottish. Cunt and twat, love you, I love it. Love you, you cunt. But I would say it as in, hey, you cheeky little cunt, you cheeky yeah. little twat. You know, joking with my friends. It's the meaning right? behind that. Yeah, I would say, I'd say another word if I was mad. That day, I wasn't even angry. He couldn't get me angry. I was going on holiday. I'd just signed up the biggest job in my life. So anyway, it comes out in the press. It's honestly everywhere. And I just couldn't get out of bed. And nobody forced me to get out of bed. My kids were trying to console me. Um, were you suicidal? Eh? Were you suicidal? No. No, I, I wasn't at my worst at this point. The worst was after the court case. And I got a message off Ashley and it just said, I've got some really good friends. I said, Al, you know, Alexis and David Lewis, who were Jewish, were very, very, very good friends of ours. It was more explaining. Now it's in the press. This is what my husband's trying to tell me. So he said... Hey, Dan, I've left you in bed to rest. I've gone to the gym, then the architects in Manchester. Call me when you're up and feel better. The worst has gone. God, it makes me upset. And it's already history, although it appears shattering to us lot, to most of the world, and people with their own problems, it's nothing more than a one-minute read. That's now history. I really don't think we could ignore speaking to key people in our life and friends. I would make a list today, even just a little text message, but just to call people, starting with my dad. Oh, fucking hell. John Cordwell, Dave and Alexis. And then, with my eyes are watering, and then we can start to repair everything. You have so many good friends. 
and a family that adores and loves you. So rest assured, we will come through this stronger than ever. I love you. No rush to you to get out of bed. <laughs> so I literally just thought, for everything I've talked about today, my interviews about my parents bringing me up and about being strong, I thought, I, this isn't just about me, this accusation. This affects my whole family. So me lying in bed's not going to help them. I've got to get up. I've got to go and beat him. I've got to go and prove my innocence. So then I, I was dreading ringing my friends, dreading ringing. And you know, every single one of them said, he said, stop right there. I remember David Lewis saying to me, stop right there. I don't want to hear any more. You don't ever have to explain to me. You're one of the least racist, but you know, John Cordwell was amazing. Ashley's dad was incredible. Um, we never told his dad because his dad's in his 90s and we didn't want to worry him. I mean, my parents knew right from the beginning because we didn't want to tell his dad unless he really needed to know. It was so, he was so he actually wanted to come to court. Um, um, so we get to the courts. Um, oh, so with housewives, I sort of decided then you because know, this is, goes back to the question why to leave the show. That man would have probably never known who I was had he not been on television. Um, I do think with the, if I'm being totally honest with you, I think with the police system, jury, CPS, when you're somebody that's a public figure, I don't think you get treated fairly at all. I think if it was Joe Bloggs on the street and the police officer said, they said this and they found, I know people that told me they've had loads of bags of coke found and they've took it off them and, sent them home. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm explaining when you're in the public eye, I think then they're too frightened of making a decision at CPS. They'd rather send you to court and let the jury decide or the judge decide because they don't want to be the one seen letting off somebody on the television. I, I do truly believe that. Because um, my court case, throwing a napkin at St. Issa should is a waste of public money. And we went to court because I threw a napkin at her. I mean, that's... That's what we're dealing with. So I've then got to grab every bit of evidence. We go to court. My barrister, Lisa, has held my hand for two years emotionally. She's one of my closest friends now. I, uh, I, she's incredible. I was petrified. It should have been a three-day court case. We're in court nine days. He got up. Um, he told some big whopping lies, like really big whopping lies. First of all, he told the police officer who was a special constable. Because obviously he wants me arrested. He started off with his 999 call that you've got the footage and you've got the 999 call and you can, they're all synced. And he's saying, quick, you can see me stood there and I'm saying, but I haven't done anything. My whole body language is quiet. I'm, I'm clearly crying. He's going, don't come near me. You need to come now. She's She's getting really agitated. She's getting really, and you can... I'm not budging. Uh, and she keeps referring to Hitler. So, but then when the police come, I forgot to tell them. So what my barrister said to him is, if she said, so what my barrister did was turn off the sound so we didn't know what it said. It didn't, because he forgot what he said on the 999 call. And then it shows you where I say, I just did that. And he goes, there's the strike. That wasn't even the, that was after when he rang the 999. He just lied through his teeth on lots of things. He said it affected him mentally. He he um, couldn't go on to public transport anymore. Um, the press attention he got, but he forgot he shared. He, he shared the press on his social media several times, which we had proof he'd done. So he deleted it before we went to court, but we already had it. So, it, it, I mean, it was a really long-winded thing. The girl told lots of lies. The only independent witness came, um, oh, the drug expert came on, um, the fingerprints came back. There was three fingerprints on them, not mine. Not even on the cigarette packet with my fingerprints. Um, I remember, I think they said at the station I could have wore gloves, but it's a bit bizarre. <laughs> anyway, there was three sets of fingerprints on both. So um, the moral of the story is it got to the last day and I can honestly say... Every night after court, I've been with Ashley 30 years. I think I told you this earlier on. I saw him cry when his granddad died. The second time in 30 years, I saw him cry 
was when he danced with his mother at our wedding. I saw my husband cry that week five times because he was in that much pain trying to protect me. He lived and breathed every part of the case. He stayed up till five in the morning listening to the audio, seeing if there was any evidence. And he was the one that found that Jake Jacobs had actually come off the stand. So we couldn't re-question him when we found that. He said he was a special and lied about it. We had to question his brother about it. Ashley found that at four o'clock in the morning. Nobody picked up on it because he'd lived and breathed because he wanted to save me because he knew I was, I was telling the truth um, between him and Lisa. And one night before court, I got up for court and I actually wet the bed. In, 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 I've never wet the bed in my life. I wet the bed. Because uh, the, the, um, I was looking every day at the jury thinking, oh, that one doesn't like me. There's just the whole... the. The stress, it's not an environment I'm used to. I could have gone to jail. You know, my, I had so many things running through my mind. And yeah, we had a great case. When We knew he told lies. We've got proof he tells lies. We've got proof he's a racist. We've got, but ultimately, 12 people have got to believe you. So my barrister all the way through just said, you can never say, we've got a great case, Dawn. He's, you know, he's, but nobody knows what that jury is. So it's very, very, very stressful. So we get to the final day and my barrister's speech, his final speech was amazing. She was amazing, sorry. She, she went on to say. Why did you choose a woman? I chose Lisa Judge, not about being a woman. She represented me in this Anita case. That's how I met her. So you just, you know, she had your back from day one? She is, honestly, as a criminal barrister, if I was a billionaire, because people say it's about money. It wasn't about money. I didn't win. I won because the because what we proved that our case, everything we said was the truth and justice. And each and every, so I'll get to the jury in a sec. So it was all there, the evidence. The police hadn't even investigated. It hadn't even spoken to the one witness that witnessed everything was the customer service. They haven't even they hadn't even interviewed her. They had no statement from her. The only statement we had from an independent police, sorry, independent witness was the train manager who was the one that told me to get on the train. And he got on the stand and he said, he said, and when I came here, she was very clearly upset. He was very aggressive. He was shouting. She's a racist. I told him to calm down. He was swearing and shouting. My barrister said, what was she doing? He said, she was clearly upset. He said, how would you describe her? He said, she was actually very nice. And he said, she grabbed my hand and said, please help me. And my barrister said to him, this was an Asian man. Um, I forgot his name now, off the, a train manager. And he said, she said to the, um, the gentleman, is there anything on him that would you could see he was Jewish? And he didn't. Not only did he not say no, he said absolutely not. Because he didn't wear a... Uh, what are they called? Oh, but the hat's called. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. He didn't... He didn't cap have, thing. Yeah, he wasn't an orthodox Jew, Jewish man. He was, it, it was, there were two young lads. In fact, if anything, I think he looked more Italian. I've got friends that look a, got a little bit of a Jewish look, you know, for the Jewish community. But I promise you, I, I had no idea he was Jewish. Neither did the the independent witness, neither did the policeman. The policeman was interviewed, having then when he saw all the evidence, because they never, he was very junior. The officer that arrested him was extremely junior. And in actual fact, he'd been off with, with nerves, I think. I felt really sorry for him. When he actually was up on the stand and he looked at all the evidence, she actually said, knowing now, and you've seen all the evidence that, do you think it's been investigated correctly? Knowing what you know now today, would you want this lady being found guilty? And he said no. And he actually smiled. I felt sorry for him. He smiled. Even though he arrested me, even though he put me in the back of the van, that's how soft I am. I actually felt really sorry for the for the officer. And then it came to the final speech, and, and my barrister was... It was the most emotional, traumatic thing, that final speech. I was... I, was, I mean, I cried a lot in court. When I saw the footage on the body cam of me pleading with him, please don't put me in the back of a van, it was really difficult for me to watch. My husband was crying, I was crying, it was really bad. And every day you like, 
when you're in court, you're thinking, I'll put my crisp there because that's good luck. We've got to do this. And we ended up going a bit doolally with it because I was so panicking about I was going to get found guilty. And she got to the final speech and she said, she said, I, I love going on holiday. She said, I got to Euston Station. I can recite it word for word because this last speech will stick in my mind for the rest of my life. <clears throat> so she said, my husband cut me up. In fact, my husband still today can't, she, he actually can't get the final, you know, they do the final speech. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going on holiday and um, I was at Euston Station and I seen this family, they had like suitcases. She thought, oh, I wish, this is her speaking to the jury. She said, I thought, I wish I was going on holiday. She went, but unfortunately I've got to come here. She said, how many of you when you go on holiday, you go in WH Smith and you think I'll buy a good book and you go up the, to the top of the thing and you grab the book and it says, and you, and you buy it because of what it says in the front of the cover. Racial aggravated assault, possession of a class A. I was actually, I had three counts because I had racially aggravated assault against Jake Jacobs, but I had the same against his brother because his brother heard it. So I had two counts with that and then the drugs, possession of a class A. So she said, here's the front cover of the book. Racial aggravated assault, possession of a class A. She said, I'll leave that thought with you. Then, because I'm, my, my, my husband's at the back thinking, why should, why should I go in about books? Why should I tell, remind him about all the evidence? So she then went into all the evidence for an hour. She then came back. She said, I want to bring you back to that book. She said, do you know what's special about this book? Oh, hang on. She said, how many of you have bought a book and when you read the end, it was nothing like what it said on the cover. She said, but you know, the difference to this book, this book's got 12 authors. She said, that girl there, how many of you, she said, have gone, I've got it all wrong. How many of you have got a bedtime story by your mum and dad, your auntie, your uncle, your brother, your sister, and when you get to the end of the story, they said, and lived happily ever after. She said, this lady can never live happily ever after because unfortunately, the damage is already done. She said, but you know what's special about this book? She said, it's got 12 authors and you can simply write the end. And then she sat down. It was so un unbelievable. The jury went out. This is the best I've ever done. This is the least I've ever cried telling this story. I'm quite proud of myself. The jury went out and it was painful to watch my husband pace. When I say pace, count door panels, it was awful. It was honestly, it was awful. So it was getting towards the end of the day, and when you're in court, I don't you'll know this. The bad thing about being in court is the first part is all about what you've been accused of. So the press, you see all the negative things. The jury look at you funny. The judge looks at you funny. Everyone thinks, "Oh my God, have you done this?" It's a horrible feeling. It's only when you get halfway through the case, and we can start to prove the other side. For the first three days, but the press don't report all the good things that are being said. What about what he's lied about this? What about because it doesn't sell newspapers, and that is what's traumatic and so damaging. Because even now, when I go on Google, we're trying to get it taken down. It's I've been racist to a Aish, um, what's, the, what's the place called in Aish, where the Holocaust, um, oh, Auschwitz. Oh, I can never say yeah. it. Grand, because obviously his her grandfather was part of that, which is terrible. But I called her a disease, and they're the headlines. I, one, I've not called her a disease. Number two, I don't know you're Jewish. Number three, I've I've done, never met your granddad. I don't know any of it. So I, how dare you put a big headline? It's I mean it's shocking. So they went out, and the jury came back, and there was this one member of jury that was in the middle. That all week you cling on to hope, and you look at a jury member, and you think. I think he might have had a little smile at me or you cling on to everything. But there was this one girl that I thought she really doesn't like me. Lisa said, we used to talk about the jury every night saying, do you think they do? And I think the man on the left might like me now. And it's horrible, horrible, horrible. And, um, and so the verdict, so it was about to come to the end of the day. And she asked the judge, even if they haven't reached the decision on all three counts, can we see if they've at least reached a decision on counts one and two? And he agreed to it. And they came in and they said they'd reached decisions on count one and two. So it was the racism. My heart 
was pumping out of my chest. It happened so quickly because I thought it was going to have to go through some other stuff. It just said to me, stand up, Mrs Ward. Do you, the jury, find the defendant, I can remember it like I'm watching a film, Mrs Ward, guilty or not guilty of count? And I remember having my chin so far up in the air. I just took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and I just looked at the person that I thought didn't like me. Who's never once caught my eye for the whole week, this one lady in the middle of blonde hair. And she just turned around and went, is it unanimous? Yeah, is it unanimous? No. Or just... Not guilty. I went, <laughs> And when I say, two jurors cried, my, my barrister had to hold back, because the, what the noise I made, apparently you can't make it. It's like a barrister told me what it's called. It's like a, uh, it's like a, something that comes from within, within your chest. And I just collapsed on the wall and broke down. The following morning, they were 20 minutes gone. They came back in, all 12 jurors not guilty. So then the court's over. I've got found by all the jurors, a nine-day court, not guilty. But what was absolutely remarkable and really grateful is... I'll never be, I mean, I've said this time and time again, I owe my life to Lisa Judge and Ashley, but I wouldn't have got through without them. But every single jury member waited an hour outside the gates, and when I went outside the gates, they all came over and gave me a love and said, you, have, you should have never, ever been in this courtroom, what you've gone through. And I, I remember turning around and saying to the girl, uh, oh God, I thought you didn't like me. And she went, oh, no, I like you from the beginning. It's quite funny, actually, because she's strong. Lisa Judge is strong. If you are going to be a liar in front of Lisa Judge. She will catch you out every time. And I remember before going into court, John Cordwell ringing me, and he said to me, all you've got to do, Dawn, is tell the truth. Yeah, you are up against three people, but it's a lot harder to lie on the stand than it is to tell the truth. So when I got outside, one of the other um, bar um, jurors said, I think I'm in love with your barrister. And another one went, I'm not, she shits me up. She actually couldn't travel back with us, but I owed my life to her. But then, I guess, then I should be on top of the world. I get on the train, just really quickly something that I forgot, and this is why I broke down in court. When I actually told my children that what I'm being charged for, I think my daughter was 10 at the time, and she said, I told my 13-year-old, my 12-year-old at the time, the older girls already knew, Charlie said to me, I already knew, she'd already been earwigging over the past two years. Aston said to me, oh, and this is what really got, this is what made me want to fight more than ever. She said, um, I explained to her, she said, if you go to prison, mummy, will they let you out at least once a week to see us? Or can we, can we come, you know, uh, or will you come home every day? I said, they won't go to prison because I didn't want my daughter worrying about my prison. She said, the other thing, I want to help you. She said, I'll tell you. She's on, just started Instagram. She said, somebody called you a crackhead on Instagram <laughs> on my DM. She said, but you know what? Don't you worry, mummy. I know your head's not cracked. And it was the innocence of that. She obviously didn't realise they meant crack cocaine. She thought they meant my head was cracked. I just thought, I've got to fight this for my kids. Somebody messaged your 10-year-old daughter. Yeah. Says that. Well, really, she, yeah, yeah. Fucking they messaged, scumbag. Oh, no, I, I mean, Taylor... We got messages that Taylor's a racist. She's only with Riyadh. Sorry, Taylor's only... Uh, I, was she pregnant at the time? I can't remember. Was she pregnant? Before she got pregnant. She's only with Riyadh because he's Muslim to hide my racism. She's racist herself. She's only Honestly, the things that people said. Um, when in actual facts, the only racist person in that courtroom was, was him. He's, he's done it again. I've had somebody contact me on Instagram. He's accused them of the same thing, a work colleague of his, and he's told them he's, uh, apparently, um, you know, I've seen racist slang on his, on, his, on his Twitter, but he's deleted them all now, obviously. I've got them all. He, the only person racist in that room was the person that was accusing him. And what's the most upsetting thing about the whole thing is... For me, somebody who accuses, and I, th I genuinely think that they should bring this law in because it gets thrown around too much. If you accuse someone of being racist and you're proved to be, that the person that you're accusing is proved to be innocent of not doing that, then that should be a crime in itself. Because to use your race as a weapon, it, I, I really do think it should be a criminal offence. Because, uh, yeah. you know, let me tell you, it cost me hundreds of, it cost me thousands and thousands of pounds, that court case. 
it costs the taxpayer the same because because <coughs> it's CPS, he doesn't pay a penny. And by the way, when I get found not guilty, I don't get any money back. Yeah, that man is allowed to walk away. I've wasted all that taxpayer's money, been found to be a liar. I've not. I've been found guilt not guilty. Sorry, not guilty of twelve jurors. How is he allowed to walk away and not have any kind of repercussion? What's going to stop him now doing it against somebody else? Anybody Fortunately, who makes, uh, I had a good family around me. Anybody who makes false allegations should be in prison. Oh. Or, or, there needs to be some sort of crackdown for it, for anybody, whether it's no matter what kind of crime it is. If people are telling lies, they deserve to be put in jail, for me personally. But there's too many accusations. And it's the thing about the press, they're jumping on accusations. Accusations destroy lives. Accusations make people suicidal accusations, kill people. So there needs to be more protection for... Well, I thought I was a strong person and I got through that and I thought the worst is over. So we got on the train home, but we came back to... I was living in Dubai, by the way. So I've not... I've t I moved to halfway through... When it came out in the press, I've missed this bit. When it came out in the press um, and we went to Dubai, I just wanted out of the UK. I wanted out of the UK. I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel... I could travel alone. I didn't feel I could have a few drinks. That situation made me feel so vulnerable. I'll, I don't think I will ever be the same again. It's I don't. I'm not as open with people when they're talking to me. I'm very. I'm very. Hi. Yes. No. I used to be very chatty with people. I just don't trust anyone now. I don't. I don't. You know. Actually, my husband always says to me, "Don't go to London again. You have to travel with somebody." Always. And it does scare you. It does. And I just thought, I don't want to be anymore in a country where, even though I've been found not guilty, you'll never get rid of that tag. It's like, you know, I probably won't work in TV again. No, you've been found not guilty. I was placed, when you Google my name, it's James English Fug. Women beat her two women accused me of pulling hair, kicking, punching them, spitting on them. My saving grace is I had the CCTV. All charges were dropped, never got as much as I find, but the the papers still run with what I was charged with. In no, fact, that's the problem. I, CCTV. Uh, they had CCTV. I don't really give a fuck anyway, to no, be honest. As a man, me, but you kind of do, but, but uh, you, then you, again. You know, well, I, 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 I think it's great that you feel like that. But if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a really strong person myself. And it's easy for me to say I don't give a fuck. Yeah. But in actual fact, I really do. Everybody and I live my life now. Does, I get that, yeah. So I, I came from court that day. All my family were amazing. I have got the most incredible family, and this is what I keep saying to you. My biggest attribute in life is my kids, my husband, my, my parents, my aunties, my uncles. I came home and they were all here, and they know I'm quite gregarious, so they always like people around me, and they all stayed the night. And we all had to drink, we all got drunk, we all celebrated. I should be on top of the world. The next morning I woke up, done a big cup breakfast, and it's, oh, it's my favourite It's my favorite part with my family with me all around the table having a fry up. We're all chatting, small talk. Um, and all of a sudden my face started twitching, my hands started closing, my mouth, my jaw dropped, my head was twitching, and I kept saying there's something wrong with me, so I can't stop, my heart was beating, and I ended up where I was that bad that I had to go on beta blockers, I, I ended up with post-traumatic disorder, and I didn't actually, I'd obviously kept it going for the court case, but as soon as it was all over is when all the symptoms came out, I mean, I was only on tablets for a few days, but I did something that I've never done in my life. I'm always with Ashley. I'm always with people. I'm not, I don't really like my own company. I don't mind it for an hour, but I always, I'm always. i that kind of person that likes people around me. And I left my family, Ashley, my kids, and I got on a plane and I told them I'm going alone. I'm going to go a week earlier than everybody. And I went back to Dubai. I, put, I had a shower, I put my pyjamas on. I watched Netflix, I went on walks, and that's what got me into walking, actually. And I thought, I don't want to be on tablets, I, 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 I want to get off them. I need calm in my life, I need, I need positivity. And slowly but surely it started to mend. I still will never be the same, but it, I can't tell you how much it affected me. It's the most traumatic thing. And something does need to change, because how can you go away and do that to somebody else? I was lucky, because I've got a big, support around me and we got we got through it well people do that to people they don't get through it I could have been, I could have been in jail I could have been racism my lawyer said I don't think you'll go to jail but 
the worst case scenario is you, you can go to jail. They could have made an example of you yeah. where you're spending 12 months. Yeah. But anyway. How are you feeling with it all now that you've kind of opened up about it and kind of released it? You obviously dealt with it your own way with your family indoors. But how are you feeling now? To be honest, now? like, I don't feel any different really. You still worry um, about it? Yeah. Um, what I can't, people always, I never forget my barrister saying to me, I'll let you tell the story once or twice, even the last her speech but after that you've got to put it to bed you've got to not tell that person and no just don't tell a single person again because you it's over you don't need because you need to move on and you won't move on you make yourself ill but the problem i've got is when i meet a jewish person or i meet an asian person or i meet I, i'm and they love me and i'm thinking i just need to say something because you might see it on google so then i and they said oh, no. i said no i feel i really need to tell you if you don't mind if you and I've relived that story again because I don't want them to think. Because if I don't tell them, I think, are they going to look on? Do you know what I mean? So I'm really even living. if they do look on, you've got not guilty. Sometimes the more you can explain it, the more it just resurfaces and no, the, the stress yeah. that comes back. So there comes a time after this, flip the fucking chapter. Mm -hmm. You've been trying to be done over with some little fucking mug who has been made up rumours and made up shit. But listen, it could have potentially destroyed your whole life it did at some degree well, it didn't it but destroyed my children it could have pushed you to fucking suicide it could have pushed you to i can't take this because that's what pressure does because sometimes we care too much what others think especially when it's in the press especially with family kids going to school getting dms it affects everything has that ripple effect where it affects every single fucking person around you but there does come a time you go do you know what fuck him he but doesn't deserve the any time, more of my even, energy it's my kids it's not about me my kids they got contracts cancelled like that yeah, you know, it's terrible. Like Look Brown's at Johnny cancer. Depp. He fucking lost Pirates of the Caribbean. He lost all his deals because his missus was fucking making accusations that it was a nutcase and it was her. It was a crackpot. No, no, but the beauty of that, can I be honest with you? If I could wish for anything, because I've not explained it great today because I'm a bit emotional. If I could have one wish, I wish to God we could have filmed our court case. That's why he's got it all back. But nobody saw my court case. You only see with the little snippets the paper tell you. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows the full story. You don't even know the full story today. Because there was so much evidence he, that he was, a, he was a liar. He embarrassed himself. He was in, she, she absolutely had him in. Not just him, all of them. All, all three of them who went on the stand and said I said it. Both him, his brother and his girlfriend. It was like something off a really bad acting movie it was horrific so clear to see johnny depp had a camera and i, and I said it's so unfair that we can't have a camera in here because that would have proved me innocence even more how did your other cast members deal no, with it did you have support every single one of my cast members supported me they know i'm not racist um because usually if there's any grievances somebody would have a field day with negative press or someone who they don't like yeah but they didn't. Fair play. They didn't, to be fair. Because, I, like I said, there's only a couple I don't speak to. I, one of them tried to get involved. I'm not even going to give her the satisfaction. So how's life been now? Well, she never achieved it, thank God. How's life been with it now? The best I've ever been. So we moved to Dubai. Um, and Good decision? Or did you feel as if you were running away? No. No, I, no, no, I, I didn't think I was running away. Um, I knew when I left the show... Um, I left the show prematurely because I knew what was coming up. I knew that this was all going to be coming out. Um, and I, I'm eternally grateful to the show. I still watch it now. I'm still supporting it. I would never, ever say a bad word about the Real House as Cheshire. Would you ever go back? Um, no, not as a cast member, no. Too long a fucking delay, that means you will. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't go back as a cast member. Would I go back for a little cameo? Christmas? No. Maybe would I, would I, I, don't, I wouldn't at the moment, but would I in the future? Maybe I'd just go back and just do a little cameo role, just for a joke, you know, just to say I, I'm back, but then go. <laughs> do you miss that? Um, I miss a lot of the... Um, um, yeah, I miss... I'm not going to say I don't miss it because I do. I miss a lot of the cast. Look, when you're filming a show like that, you get very close. You get you make friends with production, and there's a lot of fun times you have, you know. Um, but in actual fact, I've got a lot of other things that I'm spending a lot more quality time with my family. Um, there's, 
I've got things I'll do myself in the future. Um, I've got little things in the pipeline that might upset a few people in the UK coming out. So Good. I can't speak about that yet, but I will do when we're not on this mic. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm loving Dubai. I think it's amazing for the children. It's a change. Um, my, do- my son-in-law looks like he's, this isn't going out in the next week anyway, is it? No. Yeah. So um, I've got one, du- my, Darby and Mike. I've got four grand, I've got obviously four. I've got two step-grandchildren, two grandchildren, four girls. I've got Darby and Taylor and Sky and Mike hopefully coming to Dubai this year. Riyadh's obviously at the moment speaking to Saudi Arabia. It's all over the press at the moment. So hopefully by the end of this year, the whole world clan, whole ward clan are going to be in Dubai. But it's the best thing we ever did. This, you know, I tell you what I love about Dubai and what I'm very proud to be British. I'm very proud of my roots. But the one thing that really lets England down is a lot of bitterness. People don't want to see people do well. Uh, I think you find. A lot of people that are quite bitter, quite jealous. What I love about Dubai is people want to help you. There's, there's a lot of backstabbing because you just don't. Maybe I'm naive. I've only been there another two years now, but I find people want to help you. They want to give you a leg up. They want to see you do well because there's always someone with a lot more money. This, Dubai is such a growing economy. It's good for my business, my interior design business. Um, it's you know it's just amazing. I just think. I could never, ever, once my children and my parents leave the UK, everyone else that's important to me in this country can come and see me in Dubai and have a good holiday. I'll have nothing to come back for them. How is it having four daughters? One probably is more the resemblance of you with the footballer, Man City superstar, won a European Cup. How is that as a daughter when she's... No, so, um, what do you mean? Well, your daughter, obviously you went down with the football husband and career, your daughter, other daughter's done the same. That's the flute though, yeah. So I've got four girls, obviously yep. Darby's the eldest, 28, Taylor's 25, uh, and then I've got Charlie, 16, Aston's 14. I've hardly even spoken about my children today, which is the biggest part of my life I haven't spoken about. So I am going to do before we go, because I want to make you listen, sorry. So I am super proud of them. They're all very different. In fact, when I say they're all different, so Darby's very much like, she looks like me, but with dark hair. Everyone thinks Taylor looks like me because I'm, I've got a blonde, but under all these pleats, she's a very dark head. I'm actually naturally very dark. I'm darker than Darby. So Darby looks like me, but she's more like a dad in personality. She's a lot more um, laid back, not ele- a bit elegant, not ele- I can explain, a bit more chilled. She's very, she doesn't warm to people straight away. She's always got a guard up. Super intelligent, really ambitious. Taylor's looks like Ashley, completely like me. I would say Taylor's the best version of me. Uh, a bloody argumentative, honestly, but got a heart of gold as well. Um, and Charlie and Aston, because I've got January, February, March and April, they've got exactly two years apart. Then we had a nine-year gap then. The two younger ones are two years apart. And the youngest looks like Taylor. Aston looks like Taylor. Charlie looks like... Derby, and they've got the same person. It's like having the two kids the same again, like Groundhog Day. They're exactly the same as their older sisters, but younger. Um, We do everything as a family. So when you're saying like with Taylor, so with um, engaged to Riyadh, Derby's also engaged to Michael, who's also a successful entrepreneur. He does property. both my girls are successful in their own right, regardless of Riyadh being a footballer or Michael being a property developer. They've got their own jewellery brand that she's doing amazing. It sounds today, Estalia. Um, it's, it's, it's doing like unbelievable, but they've always, they've done influencing for six years and they make really good money. So they're independent girls just like I was. Did you I'm ingrain that into them, 100%. even though they're with guys with Budo? No. Did you make sure still have your own independence? No, they had their own money before they came along. Yeah. Fuck them, man! That cheap ass footballers. Aren't they? <laughs> yeah. One day it starts. You only play for Man City, mate. Yeah, exactly. You only, you only just won a Champions League. Yeah, no, listen. I forget football or any. Uh, for me, anybody, it's all about. There's nobody going to be with my daughter unless I, I. I'm like, I could not wish for two better men to be with my child, my girls, like Rian and Michael. They're all friends. They all go out. 
and they're all they have to go out and for you know michael's good friends with riyadh now we're all oh, we go out we pretend to be all of us as a big family even if we're going on a night out we all go out together but as as a parent you my biggest fear would be my daughter's bringing home somebody i don't like because you're never going to change their mind and could you imagine you stuck with someone marrying that you don't like i couldn't think of anything worse and i they could not Riyadh and Michael are absolutely the most amazing son-in-laws, the most amazing fathers, and the amazing husbands or husbands to be, you know. Um, they're lovely. My girls have chose well. But having said that, they're my daughters. They won't put up with no shit of anyone. How the fuck does that deal with five girls in the house? Uh, it's difficult. It must be fucking difficult, man. Yeah. And, and we've got four dogs. Because my daughter, there's, listen, no women or girls ever have their finger me wrapped around her finger except my daughter. That's well, the only one. Well, he's got four of them. And he's got four plus and, you. Yeah, yeah. So how, does he struggle with that? Are they kind of uh, used to it yeah, now? It's, yeah, to be fair, he's always like trying to put fires out because it's me scrapping with the girls. <laughs> and then what I do, I bollock him because he's not defending me or telling her off. He's not, he says, how does this happen? I've been out all day. I've come home. I've not even heard the row. Why are you falling out of me? Because you've not told her this. Uh, and then he gets all the hormones and mum and, and then the girls fight and you sort of like Ashley's very good at just like mellowing in the background but what I will say about Ashley the girls will scream at me all day long even now they will they never scream at the dad if Ashley ever once says anything or raises his voice they listen to him straight away and it, and you know what is nice about having girls which obviously you've got you've got one of each mm. haven't you you said yeah. you find a girl girls always come home they're always daddy's girls and they always come home. So at Christmas time, I would see my daughters, I would see Michael and Rhea, well, my, more than his own mum, because they always want to be with the mum at Christmas. And that is the beauty about, when you've got boys, they go off with the weather, they marry and they tend to spend more time with the, I don't know if you've found that when you, but my girls are always at my house, so they, uh, they never leave home. Why is family so important to you? Just is like I'm obsessed with my children. Um, like it's I, I'm I'm very close to my parents. I've always been about family values. Um, I mean, listen, I've embarrassed my kids to death. Darby sings; she's a great singer. She's not sang for ages, but I, every time we go to my, I'm sticking a mic in her mouth, going, you know, get up. I, I think I've been traumatized. Her. It's just because I'm proud. I'm always talking about my kids, you know. Um, oh, by the way, Aston's just won. A, um, well, all my kids have been sporty. I mean, I'm a nightmare. I'm so competitive, really competitive. Ashley once snapped a muscle in his leg because I made him go in the skipping race at school in the sports day. I win every sports day myself. I, I cheat and put a bobble in, you know? When you yeah. put the um, beanbag on your head. I've won every sports thing, so I've been like that with my kids. I'm always, always pushing them. I've always been that really, really pushy mum. And that's because I don't care about myself. Everything I do in my life, it's, me and Ash can go away quietly and just live in a little two up, two down, in the countryside somewhere and never see anyone again. Everything I do is because I want my, my children to be bigger and better than I can ever be. And that's all I'm interested in. My best nights out, my best days, um, is when I'm with my children and the family. Like lockdown was a real special time for me. How are you feeling with speaking out today and kind of telling things from your side, telling your life story? I know you've got a lot more in nervous. you. Yeah. Are you nervous? I'm, I'm like, yeah, I feel a little bit nervous because um, there's a lot more to the court case because I'm so passionate about it. I don't know if I felt a bit stop starty and people are really going to grasp what I'm trying to get across. Listen, but, but you still found not guilty. But you've yeah. only got a right to tell things for your side to say, listen, I never done fuck all. No. You're free under the bus. You were free, fucking free riot vans to come and pick a woman up is not right. Handcuffs is not right. Oh, that's terrible, honestly. I can understand. Listen, if the copper said sorry at the end and go, do you know what? I shouldn't have maybe done that. And no, I actually didn't feel the same way about the policeman as I did. Yeah, because it's fucked up. Man. If no, anybody, he said he's, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not normal. Should. No. You're not causing We could have things further. We could have sued them privately. We could have, because Ashley wanted to do that. He wanted to go after them privately. But, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't face another two yet. I just thought I need the negativity out of my life. I need, I need to go back to Dubai and now live my life with my family with focusing on positivity and not negativity. Because when you're fighting something like that in court or any kind of court case, even you know, a 
business court case, whether it's... Um, yeah, law or civil. Yes. It takes up all your time and you end up with negative energy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I left everyone and went back to, I need positive energy in my life now. And I've got so much to, my family, I have got so much to do and show in our life that I want to concentrate on doing projects in my family, doing TV things with my family. Um, we've got family, we've got family businesses going forward that we're doing in Dubai. At the end of the day, I'm extremely lucky I've got, people say they can count the friends on one hand. I'm lucky I've got, I've got a couple of hands I can count my good friends on. Yeah, yeah, I'm lucky. when you're on TV... Before I went on TV, my circle was medium. I went on TV, my circle was massive. My circle is a third of what it was even before I went on TV. Yeah, you see, I feel that way. Yeah, and I've got great friends, I've got great family, I've got great kids. I just couldn't, I'm, I feel so fortunate. I honestly cannot believe my life. And I'm going to go away and live it and say, fuck the court case and everything else. Yeah, you've got I'm to say that, fuck them. Yeah. Because you've already came so far from that girl who's been working since 13, 14 to make something her life, to saving all her money, to throwing it into projects and making them successful. You've all, you're have you already a winner. Four beautiful daughters, loving husband. You're winning. You're fucking winning. And this is the thing with life sometimes we can concentrate on, keep trying to work, keep trying to make bigger plans. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter if you're sitting in a cardboard box, it's your family, your mum and your dad who are fucking right there with you and the cold no, uh, and that's, that's it the, that's honestly it. out of everything you just said about all the things i've done in my life i said it to you earlier my biggest achievement is my kids yeah that's what? out of any business deal i've ever done any what you know and and i think if i could say that was my mum's biggest achievement in life because she brought me up well that i brought her i brought my children up well and yeah i, I really do think i'm half the parent she's been and that's the one thing i I will say that for any anything that anyone says that's negative about me, no one can ever question me as a parent. Very emotional today as well. Do you feel as if yeah, is that like, you as a person anyway, or is it just yeah, because quite of this? emotional? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't been. No, listen, this is good because mm -hmm. I've shivered and I've, but I haven't actually <laughs> they've not dropped down. They've not dropped down my face. Yeah. I really didn't think I was capable of that, and I've just done it. That's you so, getting stronger. That is, yeah. Plans for the future done. Um, I've reached the big five oh now. Oh, bastard! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're all <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Go get me a 40 year old. Let's get some bikinis. I've been training on. I've been, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not one of those grow, grow gracefully women, put it that way. I'm already booked in for a facelift. Um, there's no chance I'm growing all gracefully. So, the plans for the future for me are to. We've got some, I've got some really, and we're doing really well in Dubai at the moment with our, with the Vista, with our Vista International. So we've really touched on my real business. My real business is I'm an interior designer. Um, plans are that we continue to conquer Dubai, move into other parts of the UAE, do really well with work. I, I've got my London rug company, which you can buy online. I've not spoken about that today, which is an amazing business. Launched the rug range. I want to bring more ranges out so i have to work less with customers i want to go off and do a bit of like traveling with ashley and chill and i would like to potentially be retired in the next i was going to say five years but then that won't give me enough time to push aston i'm not to be 60 i think do you think you could ever retire though with your method of work ethic from a young age probably not but it... i've got a great future yeah. More family time, more quality family time and keep um, enjoying life as I am doing now in a positive way and keeping good people around me uh, and never interfering in anybody's argument at a train station ever again. <laughs> it's just minding uh, my own business. For any women watching, even man, how do you become successful? What's the main ingredient for you? Um, I just think... I said it to you before, when you want to do something, if you believe in something, go your gut instinct. But never if you fail, you can always try again. We all, I said this, me saying, we're all born the same way, we all die the same way. We all start off in life on the same path. So some people are risk takers. They take the risk, they fail, and they don't ever want to try again because it hurts them. I will take a risk every time and just keep trying. So be honest, be uh, build relationships with 
network, build relationships, build trust, build values. And if you fail, try again. For anybody watching that's in that struggle right now, where you've been and you think there's no way out, the world's against you, what advice would you have for them? Um, if you haven't got, I have a very good family support around me, a very good family support. Would it, would it, could it have been different if I didn't have that 100%? I would say, if you haven't, always speak to people. If you haven't got that family support, then speak to people. But always know, time's a healer. And as long as you've got your health, as bad as it feels at the time, that the whole, like I've read the text that Ashley sent me, one day it gets better. So never give up and speak. What's your biggest life lesson that you've learned with the 50 years on this planet? The biggest life, life, life lesson I've learned is I've always put your family first. Don't get carried away. Never forget where you came from. Don't get above your station. Don't think you're it. Don't get overconfident. And don't think you're invincible because you're not. But the less said, the better. That's the biggest life lesson. Keep away from Houston Station. Yeah, but, you know, I do think, I said to you before, that there was times when I thought it was it. But I have everything I need, right, in, in these four walls. Yeah. That's all I need. Just before we finish up, just finish on that, that. Do you feel as if maybe you were, did you feel as if you were invincible yourself, the life that you had, all the popularity as well, the money? Did you feel as if you're good? Until bang, you're kind of not humbled, but you're brought straight back down to earth that your life can be fucking ripped away in a second. Oh, God, yeah. I felt, yeah. It's nothing to do with money. Well, I guess, yeah, it is. I don't know, but I, I guess I never thought... It's difficult saying that because I sort of think maybe you've got a point there, but then, no, because I never thought for one minute, yeah, yeah. I never thought for one minute that you could be accused of something and locked up and charged and when well, you've not done something. I thought we're in a country where, well, just because he said it doesn't mean he's, I've said it. Well, surely you can't. So, but I, I guess it definitely made me humble. Yeah, I definitely thought it was blessing. Not, I would be more brazen going around, chatting. I'm a bit of a bag of nerves now. I'm always polite with people, but I'm not quite as... Open. Yeah, and I don't flaunt around as much as I used to do. Yeah, but that can be a good thing. For anybody watching and just wanting to be get involved and reach out and say, well done, blah, blah, blah. Your, what's your businesses? How can they get involved? Yeah, great. What's your social medias? What's your websites? Yeah, so um, London Rug Company, which is on Instagram, or it's londonrugcompany.com. And then um, my other business is Arista Interiors on Instagram. Um, yeah, um, again, and don't watch for on Instagram. I don't really do anything else. I don't do Twitter as much. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking ruthless. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, um, I really, lo I've really loved being on here. It's been amazing. I've watched you probably for the last couple of years. So. Yeah, legend, man. I just want to know what have happened to the two hundred million pound house you worked on? You, you oh, never really kind of finished that, yeah. Well, I won uh, London's best design scheme twenty twenty two, and world's best residential swimming pool. So I wanted two international awards for it at the Grosvenor House, but forgot to tell that one as well. Just slipped it in that I'm an award-winning interior designer twice over. Congratulations. Listen, Don, nothing but love and respect for you, for what you're achieving, the kids that you've raised, the husband that you've got. You're smashing it. You've come through the dark side. Now, listen, you've turned 50. Hopefully the next fucking 50 years are nothing but the best for you. I really appreciate it. Would that. you like to finish up on anything else? No, I'm quite done. Listen, God bless. Take care. Thank you, and my I'll darling. See you soon. Thank you.